if you just do it, it'll turn out okay. Hey everyone, it's me and Jackson here. RJ's running late, but we're here to talk about selection. What kind of selection? I, I let the, oh, Jackson to fill you in on that little detail. Hello. Yes, we're going to talk about the three major types of selection today: uh, artificial, natural, and sexual selection. Oh yeah, if uh, Nestling is in the side chat, we'll toss him the link if he shows up, uh, like we did last time. Um, oh well, I guess I can do that right now. See if he. Um, so selection. Our natural selection is, is typically defined as a differential reproductive success of a population. And that, in essence, refers to how uh, good the members or how there it refers to how, yeah, basically the rates, the differential rates at which the members of a population reproduce. And so some are going to be better at producing offspring than others. Per they are per their their particular variations, and those variations are going to be passed on if they are beneficial or at the very least not deleterious. Um, let's see if I can send Nestlig the oops 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 very strong one. I have a slideshow here, and so I can show. Various pictures for each of the um, concepts. Always good. Your, your slideshows are always excellent. Okay, so let me pull that up. Share screen. Uh, nope, that's the wrong one. There it is. That's the correct one. Okie dokie. Can you see my my slideshow? Yes. Okay, so a couple of terms first. Oh, if it wants to go, give it a sec. It's very slow. The first thing I I thought would be pertinent to do is give some definitions relevant to this topic. And uh, there you go. Okay, can you see my definitions slide now? Let me, let me get rid of the chat real fast if I can. Let me get bigger. There. You can see the definition slide? Yeah. Yes. I made it bigger. Okay. So, so I think this uh, PowerPoint, this slideshow will be useful to help explain why these things are, are part of evolution. And they're not just something that, say, creationists can... Uh, co-opt and just be fine with. So first and foremost is a definition of bio of biological evolution. This is really the only sense of evolution that matters. We were talking about uh, Kent Hovind earlier, so none of his other you know, definitions of evolution really matter. Not stellar, not chemical evolution. None of those really matter. It's really just biological evolution, which is a change in allele frequencies in a population over generations. And how long and that... And how long that has, has that been the official defin definition? Like 80 years, 20, 50 years, 20 for, years? For a pretty long time, about as long as we've had population genetics, which has been since like the 1930s and 40s. It's been a little while, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> yeah, the, so, it, it's yeah. ironic that the population There's genetics RJ. came along before they knew the genetics. <laughs> yes, that yeah, that is actually kind of, kind of funny. You had Haldane and um, Mayer and the other... Uh, guys all kind of working out how uh, alleles or well you know the variations spread through the population before anyone actually knew what the you know what the molecule of inheritance was what it looked like any of that kind of stuff no. so yeah in Welcome fact Dan Stern Cardinale was just on Apologia today a brand mm -hmm. new posting on Haldane's dilemma and why the genetics of Haldane back in 1957 didn't hold up <laughs> yeah Haldane even if I remember correctly, he he said his math might not be correct yeah. while he was coming up with the quote dilemma. And so then when his when it was shown shortly thereafter, yeah, the math is wrong. It was kind of like, OK, I thought the math was possibly wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that memo has not sunk down to uh, um, the uh, Ray Comfort creationist set, though. 
Well, okay. It, it, well, you know, granted, Ray Comfort ha- does not not know anything about uh, the the history of biology, and especially not you know Haldane's dilemma. Um, he would he could only get that secondarily from other people, but we we all know he could not do the math involved in any of the population genetics. But well, regardless, back to your PowerPoint. Yes, regardless. Yeah. So a change in allele frequencies. So for anyone who is unfamiliar, an allele is a version of a gene. So I took this overly simplistic example, but I think it helps understand what, what it is. So if you imagine there's a single color for eye gene, and I have no idea if that's the case, but it probably isn't. If you assume there's only one eye color gene, the versions, the alleles are blue or brown or green. These are the different versions of that one gene. And think, is that talking about dominant he, 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 uh, uh, recessive genes? Yes, yes. These alleles can be dominant or recessive, depending on how many it takes to uh, to perform a certain biological function. If you need only one copy of a gene to produce a particular enzyme, then it's dominant. If you need both copies, then it's recessive. And so... Uh, uh, that's, that's Gregor Mendel stuff. <laughs> Yes. So another, yeah, that's another example where Mendel was figuring out the genetic stuff before anyone knew about genes. Um, Darwin took a stab at how genetics worked, and it was not great. He missed, um, but he Gemules. made some interesting. Yeah, yeah. His Jimmel's idea was was wrong, but he made some interesting um, yeah. associations. For instance, he did work with primroses, and at the same time, Wallace did work with butterflies and they both actually got Mendelian ratios for the distribution of traits in their populations. Wait, wait, so, wait, wait Jackson, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying that yes. stuff from the 1800s, late 1800s, the science from then has, has changed and evolved since, since, since then to 2100s. It's not the same. Shocked, back then? Shocked to hear right? that. Shocked. Come on. Um, but, but the, the funny thing about it was they were basically getting the same results that Mendel was around the same time. The only problem was neither Wallace nor Darwin had a background in math. And Darwin, we know Darwin actually saw a summary of Mendel's work, but he also did not, his German was not very good and he didn't have a mathematical background. He was very natural history oriented. And so he didn't grasp the importance of Mendel's work and really it nobody did at the like time an abstract on the field and wasn't rediscovered until quite a long time later and and the right. interesting aspect is boy was Mendel lucky to have picked peas because there were lots of plants that wouldn't have shown the neat tidy relationships that he ended up getting correct yeah that that is exactly the case and in fact he did try to do work with uh with mice, but the church said, yeah, that's animal sex. We're not okay with that. We're going to put the kibosh on that. <laughs> plant sex uh, is okay. Animal sex is. not Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's plant sex is very, uh, it's, it's not sexy. It's very austere, but no, <laughs> not to a botanist. Um, so, so you could say that you can also say that besides genetics, Mendel was also doing artificial selection. Um, I don't think it really went that far. I think it was yeah. more just the observational. Okay. Just let breed the things back and forth to see what would right. happen. Right. But he yeah, wasn't he... aiming to get a particular trait. So he was actually right. not supplying any selection, okay. which, of course, uh, is a spoiler alert for the <laughs> remainder of the PowerPoint. <laughs> right. And so, um, so natural selection, we already mentioned that. It's just differential reproductive success in a population. So in essence, some members of a population are going to have more offspring than others are. That's what differential reproductive success success means. And this is due to which variations they get. And of course, we'll talk about that more shortly. So two other definitions I think are very important to, to discuss are micro and macro evolution. Because I know there are lots of creations who love to distinguish between these but as with everything in biology it's really a sliding scale there is no the point at which microevolution stops and macroevolution starts is very nebulous uh it's easy to say oh it's below or at the species level but considering there's not just one species concept that doesn't really mean anything uh and this is another example uh, uh lamont as you mentioned earlier 
with um, population genetics, the definition of evolution was laid down, or this one was laid down like 80 years ago. This is another example. These were almost 100 years ago. And so, yeah, so this was a long time ago. Um, these these are not recent inventions. These were around long before like any of the modern creationists are, or you know, came around. So. Yeah, it can be argued that while individuals replicate the nuts and bolts of evolution, the level of selection is really operating at a population level, even though yes. only individuals replicate. <laughs> Correct. And so... Um, so yeah, microevolution is genetic change below the level of species. Uh, microevolution is genetic change at or above, which includes speciation and adaptive radiations. Both these terms were coined by Russian entomologist Yuri Filipchenko in 1927. Um, a species, and I'm just using the general biological species concept uh, put forth by Ernst Mayer in 1942, and that is an uh, interfertile population. And then speciation is the formation of a new species. So, we all good on this slide? Yep. Okay, so, basic process. All right, so, as we mentioned, uh, you have variations. You have mutations, which occur through a variety of processes. Um, uh, one of the really interesting ones, in my opinion, is a process called a tautomerization, which is basically where nucleotides... So, this picture, this little picture of the DNA, the nucleotides are the little colored um, strips on the on the, the strand. And so what's interesting is if you switch the position of the uh, what is it the hydrogen atom on on the, the end little arms of the uh, of the nucleotide, whether it's a purine or a pyrimidine, it actually changes which uh, of the bases it is. And so if you switch, or it, it changes how it appear, how the base appears to DNA polymerase. Or sorry, yeah, to DNA polymerase. And so it seems to be a different nucleotide than which one it is, even though it still is that nucleotide. So some of the natural mutations that lead to change are due to promiscuous hydrogen ions. Right. Yeah. It's and so these processes um, occur seemingly randomly like it I, I don't think as, as far as i'm aware i don't think they can predict which particular nucleotides are gonna do this at any given time so this is about as close to randomness as you can possibly get and the x's are the things that come extinct the traits that come extinct or the species yes. that come extinct so this is where yeah this is where variation kicks in so you have your original the parent the the parental generation and you have the f1 generation and so the uh, the white lineage, the first one goes extinct. Their mutations are not um, useful. They're selected against in that environment for whatever reason. They just don't produce enough offspring and they go extinct. And so then you have uh, the second lineage and the second and the third lineages both progress. And then they reach. So they reach, uh, was it one, two, F3. And then the F4 generation for the second lineage goes extinct. But uh, the third lineage, they have yet more mutations and they go on to produce an F5 lineage or an F5 generation. So, uh, so selection has wiped out the variations which are not beneficial enough for that environment. It's not yeah. about survival of the fittest. It's just survival of the fit enough to survive, yeah. which is and why... You can find examples of every one of these uh, instances in nature. But if yes. you think of the light gray at the top as a particular morphological thing, you can mm -hmm. say that after all those generations, it's gone. Its lineages still survive, but the gray, the light gray form is gone. And they're right. all darker gray than what they used to be in a range far greater than the original version. Yeah, it seems right. like the, the light gray one lasts a little bit longer than the, the, the pure white one, but not, 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 far, not long enough. Yeah, right, and then all of that, which will be the subject of, of the remaining PowerPoints, are going to deal with the kinds of factors that change the, the dynamics of why one form does better than another or not. How much of its chance, how much of its selection, how much of its sexual, and what are the all mixes and all of that. Sorry to, sorry to, to spoiler alert, the coming attraction, but that's it's the okay, kind of well, well, most people already know this. Most people, most people already know the spoilers, but it's like, like a... Like a like like say this is a mouse 
and the and in on a rock and the white mice obviously stand out so they get eaten a lot they, they get eaten a lot but the darker mouses blend the rocks better yeah right yes and in fact it will we'll cover an example similar to that later um so if you want a sort of visual that's with that is with morphology rather than with just colored dots you can look at the bottom picture here where you have a sort of leaf hopper insect uh on the top and a um a phasmid on the bottom and they both originate from these very different morphology or with these very different morphologies from a single ancestor who had a, a different type of morphology, but it underwent selection in two different directions. So this is variations the, did. So this to, is like a like a speciation slash ring species event. Yeah, I mean it, it's a speciation. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's a ring species event per se, but it is a, it is a speciation yeah. event. Yeah, you're going in you got the the Mutations which cause particular morphologies. In the bottom case, the the um, the body is becoming flattened more and more, whereas in the top, it the body is becoming taller and taller. And so, with these very minor, at first very minor, uh, changes in morphology, they become increasingly selected in particular directions until you have radically different. Uh, yeah, this morphology. is actually well after speciation. Ring species. The one yes. thing that's characteristic of ring species is that if you put all the ring together. They don't look very different from one another. They're, and in fact, segments of them can interbreed. It's only the mm -hmm. realization that the far ends of the ring can't interbreed. You realize that you're crossing a potential speciation boundary, even though the forms of them are relatively uh, 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 typical. Right. So we good on this one? Ready for the next one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, so I will put in one blurb here. Yes. In that. If you look in the fossil record where we do have good examples of things, the origin of dinosaurs, uh, mammals, and others, that the earliest forms of any lineage are very generic. They're not yes. super duper specialized. They often look very similar to organisms around them. And it's only over time that you see the specialization, specialization thing. So generic dinosaurs all look like coelophysids, regardless of what <laughs> right. and Terichian. Only later do they turn into things, lineages like sauropods and tyrannosaurs and all the rest. And that involves millions and millions and millions of years. I do have right. a, a off topic question. Can, can you like uh, make that full screen at all, or like the side scene on sure. there? Sure, it was. Yeah, we can do that. It it had problems when RJ and I were trying to run this the other day. Oh, okay, but well, we can. Yeah. I can see if it'll work. Okay, if not, so, if, not, if no, you no, no, break deal. it, it's all your fault, Jackson. Hey, it's he not no big deal. <laughs> okay, so you see the basic process. So can yes. you see the new slide? What yeah, slide we, is it on right now? It's the basic possible. process. Okay, so nope, it didn't work. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, well, we tried. Now we're so, seeing. Our, yeah, now we're seeing the next slide. Yeah, the, the plant. I can make it larger. Little doggies and birds. All right, so I'll have to make it. I'll have to manually go back and forth. All right, that's fine. Uh, so artificial selection. So this is the first type of selection we're going to talk about. So on the last slide, we saw there, as already said, we saw that selection happen. Now we're going to talk about the mechanisms, the reasons by which those particular variations are selected and others are not. So about 12,000 years ago, humans entered the uh, agricultural revolution where we started domesticating dogs and, and uh, cattle and various plants, things like that, for consumption, for protection, uh, for getting around places. And so if you look here on the left, this is Brassica oleracea, which is the uh, progenitor, or well, all the, that is what the progenitor plant looks like, but cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, all those guys are still Brassica oleracea. They're just different cultivars of it. Um, and so what humans did was we chose the variations that we liked. It had nothing to do with whether or not it actually did better in the environment. It only mattered to us whether we liked it or not. Was it, is it tastier? Is a, is the fruit uh, fleshier? That's what we were selecting for. And so when each when the parent would have a bunch of offspring, we would prevent the ones we didn't like from reproducing. Only the ones we did like, we would continue to propagate them. That's how artificial selection works. We did that for dogs also. It's how we end up with hundreds of, of breeds of dogs. And then we have pigeons down here on uh, the bottom right. And of course, uh, Charles Darwin was an avid pigeon breeder. Uh, he also bred orchids as well as many other uh, English 
men did in, in that in those days. Um, and primroses and lots of other organisms. Um, but the point is, in all these cases, we didn't select for survivability in nature. We selected for what we wanted, whether it was we want dogs to be more docile, we want them to have to be able to hunt with us better, or we wanted pigeons, which were prettier or were faster, things like or, that. Or tastier. Yeah. Or and tastier. All of these yeah. are relatively superficial surface characteristics. Yes, that can be easily selected for, and still technically would remain within the same species, let alone the same kind on the creationist context. None of the underlying biology was being selected for. So yeah. the underlying uh, homeobox genes and mitochondria and and uh, 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 mechanics of how the, the particular plant got to be the plant that you're selecting for, and how the dog gets to be the thing you're yeah. selecting for, none of that was being changed. So right. you know, like the dogs, for example, unless it the, no species uh, has happened yet, unless unless there's a big big physical difference, like Chihuahuas and Great Danes, they can still interbreed with each other. Yeah, in theory, yes. But if they were to meet each other in the wild, the Great Dane would probably eat the Chihuahua. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably the case that uh, of almost all of the species that we artificially select probably are not viable in the wild. Without yeah. active selection, they disappear. Right, can, and can uh, can. can, can Dogs, the cat, the 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 bro brachioculus, can't pronounce it. Uh, can can it sub things still? Can, can it pollen and seed to each other, or are they? Can you? Oh, can a, they? Can they cross fertilize? Yeah. The the vegetables. I would assume so. They're they're all still the same species. They're just different, you know, quote subspecies or cultivars. So I would assume they could all still. So uh, I, I, actually, wait, yeah, they can because uh, Brassica rapa, which is uh, used um, for, uh, uh, well, we used it for growing, it's the fast plants, the Wisconsin fast plants they use in a genetics lab in, okay. in undergrad. And so, yeah, you can actually cross these in various ways for particular traits. Cool, cool. I, I, I didn't know if we had, had separated them far enough that they're like, no, I'm not, I'm not into that plant anymore. Geologically, <laughs> they've been separated very, very recently. So they're yeah. still interfertile. They're uh, all I mean, high blinks from an evolutionary could, point of view. In we fact, could still speciation, natural speciation process is really slow as molasses. I mean, heck, we crossed with Denisovans and Neanderthals, and we separated from them over 700,000 yeah. years ago. Yeah, so. only within the same genus, and that gives some idea about True, I, the range of things. I, I, I was wondering how fast it is for some compared to others, because kind of like some like mosquito things can like the London mosquitoes in the underground can't breed if the mosquitoes outside the underground anymore. Well, they also have very fast... Uh, um, uh, re uh, generation, sorry. They have very fast yeah. generations. They reproduce quickly. They have a greater capacity for uh, larger scale change. Uh, and there's also the founder effect you have to consider. All, all yeah, sorts yeah. of things. I mean, it's a case-by-case -case basis. You yeah. can have speciation in a single generation if we're talking about like polyploidy, for instance. But for most organisms, it's going to take a little while. Okay. Yeah, too many yeah. people tend to confuse speciation with morphological change, and they're not right. at all identical. But, uh, a lot of species, like your bugs, can, can slip into a new technical species simply by a tiny mutation changing the time of day they breed. Which right. means yeah. now they're no longer doing it at the same time, and they split mm -hmm. off, even though genetically they're virtually identical, physically they're virtually identical, but now <laughs> they're separate breeding populations. They can theoretically go in independent yeah. directions than they would before. At, at, yeah. at the, Speciation rarely involves anything that's very visible from the outside observer. It's happening deep down in the various systems that cause one critter to want to mate with another critter, which of course is going to be the topic of more of the slide. Yeah, I see. I see. I see this in like I pick skulls of of hum humans and dogs. Dogs are closer related, but their their, their skulls are totally different. The human species are like so, like more genetically diverse, but their skulls are like totally the same. And some, some organisms have a greater plasticity in how easily their right. things can vary without being a problem. Whereas if you have an organism that's got a very complex mating factor that really requires those antlers be X big, that any variation in that is going to upset their whole ecological thing. And, and then, then there's another interesting issue that not all species are domesticatable. 
whether it's plants right. or animals, that some of them just won't work with that. And that's suggesting there's stuff going on in the genetics and the biology that's right. working against that. Yeah, I, I, is, I, heard, yeah I heard like, uh, sorry, if, if I was saying what you're going to say, but there's like those species of berry up in the mountains of like in Washington or something that they can't, they can't, anywhere, they tried to, they tried to like, Poison barrier or hoist barrier, something like that. They tried to breed down, down. They, they went, then it grows up in the mountains. It can't, can't grow up up in the soil, other other ways. Yeah, yeah and, it's, and it's, it's, if it's, things um, get connected with symbionts, bacterial symbionts, now you have a mm -hmm. new layer of who your buddies are to get by with. Right. It is an interesting. Uh, there is an interesting point that um, there there was a Russian experiment with the uh, the the silver uh, fox. Ooh, oh yeah, yeah. and we did that. a. We did a whole video on that a long time ago. Interestingly, one of my most popular videos. Uh, but what's what's neat about it is the silver fox developed dog characteristics. It developed a wagging tail um, and floppy ears. And those uh, are probably as, pleiotropic, that they're selecting yes. for one feature and a bunch of other things come along accidentally as right. a result of that. They were positively uh, selecting for cute little puppy eyes and floppy tail, but that comes along with it. Right, exactly. So, yeah. artificial selection good? Oh, yeah. We got the basics down. All right. So, so that's it on a very simple, you know, sort of Darwinian scale. So, now we're yeah. going to talk, we're going to bring it to the modern day with, with this slide. So, with this example, this is a very interesting example, in, in, in my opinion, because this is one of those. One of, one of those examples that uh, refutes the whole idea that, oh, you can't change the function of a protein. They're too complex. <laughs> well, guess what we did? It happened. Uh, so a little bit of background. So there's a type of enzyme called CRE recombinase. And what CRE recombinase does is it, it splices out a sequence of DNA between two segments. And these are identical segments. CRE recombinase cuts out DNA between uh, the, two, the segments called LOXP. So if you look at the top left, LOXP is the, are the identical segments. So what the researchers wanted to do is they said, okay, well, we know that viruses, when they insert their DNA into our genome, they flank it by long terminal repeats. And so what if we could get uh, an enzyme to do this what if we could get it to remove these rather than splice them in? And so it turns out the closest or the most similar um, sequence for this identical this identical flanking sequences to LOXP is called LOXLTR. And so <clears throat> it occurs in this HIV strain called TZB0003. So it, it unfortunately, uh, this this strain is only in a very small percentage of HIV uh, patients, but it could still do some good. So it, it, using evolution in medical science, you know, who says evolution has no, uh, no applications. So what the researchers wanted to do is they wanted to take CRE recombinase and get it to splice out the, the segment between the LOX LTR sequences. However, LOX LTR is too different uh, from LOX P to be used directly. And so what they thought and so you can think of the differences between them as mutations. And so what they said was, okay, we'll split up the mutations into two, two different uh, sec or sequences, and we'll see if CRE recombinants can identify those. So they split up the mutations in LOX LTR into LOX LTR1 and LOX LTR2. And then they tried CRE recombinants again. Oh, and this is occurring within um, E. coli for reference. Sorry if I didn't make that clear or I didn't oh. say that. Is um, this the is this the thing where they made them eat orange like oranges or the plastic eating ones or something or no that's very different okay. that's a, that's a different case with um with lots of other really cool stuff but that's not this one um so with this one so they took uh so they were like okay well it's not working on uh LOX LTR one or LOX LTR two so we'll split the mutations up further. And so they split LOX LTR1 into LOX LTR1A and LOX LTR1B, and they split LOX2 into LOX LTR2A and LOX LTR2B. So by splitting those up, CRE re they realized CRE recombinase can identify 1A, 1B, 2A, and 2B. And they use that as their baseline. 
And so what they did was they selected for the strains of E. coli, which, due to mutation, could excise the sequence between those, those flanking sequences better than the others. So they picked the ones who could do it best. They artificially selected the E. coli who were the best at splicing out these sequences of DNA. And so as they got progressively better at doing 1A, 1B, 2A, and 2B, they eventually were able to recognize, CRE recombinase was eventually able to recognize LOX LTR1 and LOX LTR2. And then they could, they repeated the process. Take the uh, E. coli and select for the strains which can do, which can splice out the sequences the best. And then after they got good enough at that, they could recognize the original sequence LOX LTR. So th this is through mutation. We, we can't control what mutations are going to appear in the population, right? All we can do is select the mutations. They weren't that designing do the end product. They, they created right. an environment in which the subcomponents could be recognized and let the natural selection <laughs> process and natural mutation process all unguided get to where they needed to go all without the assistance other than the selection of the leader <laughs> for the next cycle. Exactly. Yes. And so, and so we took this protein, which identified a different sequence, which, which was 50% different um, originally. And it can now identify the sequence and excise the DNA between them. So and there's no reason to think that exactly that kind of thing is going on in slow motion at all levels of biology, all through the history of life. Exactly, yeah, this is probably happening all the time, especially in bacteria. And all it would look like <laughs> is a teeny tiny little mutant version that does a slightly different thing with a tiny other little mutation. And it's all microevolution, 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 but we can see how it can turn into an entirely new function with a particular intention in our case, because mm -hmm. you can see it happening real time and bacteria do their things really quickly. So at this, but this, at this level is e can either be a mutation and they split the, my, was it, is it meiosis? They sp that splitting or, or make it? Well, no, my, meiosis is not occurring in these guys because these are asexual. These are bacteria. Uh, my, my toast, mitosis, not the word. Is it mitosis? What, what I mean no. is by they split them, they took the total number. So there's, what is it? Um, <laughs> I think it's, there are 30, is it 30? I think, I think there are 32 differences between LOX LTR and LOX P. And so they took, they only took like what 16 of them or something like that. And put I, I, six. I, yeah. I, I, sorry. I, I, I'm trying to figure out what the word is when the cell split. Binary fission? That's it. Okay. But, but mitosis is just for, right? Mitosis is just for eukaryote cells? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so this. So the mutations are at this at this rate. I'm not the rate. I mean, at, at this size of, of the thing, it can either be binary fission, the mutations, or maybe even uh, horizontal gene transfers and stuff. Well, it's not going to be horizontal gene transfer. This is just occurring in their DNA. They're not okay. they're not swapping sequence. This is just pure E. coli, a pure E. coli culture, and okay. they're just mutating. Okay, and being selected. Okay. Um, we good on this slide? Yes. All right. So this is artificial selection with the first one was in Darwin's day. And now we brought it all the way to present day. So this is, this is how artificial selection now occurs in the lab. All right. So we see the new slide. Novelty yeah. via mutations. All right. So, so I think one could argue or, you know, maybe they could say with the last one, oh, well, it's basically doing just a version of what it already did. It was already excising segments of DNA. You just slightly changed which segment of DNA it was excising, which is kind of a silly argument, but I could definitely hear a creationist making it. But anyways, <clears throat> so in this, so in these, now we're actually evolving novelty, evolutionary novelty. We're evolving structures which didn't, previously exist and we know they didn't previously exist so the the one on the left is heron uh, et al 2019 and in that one the the researchers involved chlamydomonas ryan hardy to become multicellular in response to predation by a parasite or sorry by a protist blah, 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 called ochromonas so ochromonas eats the chlamydomonas so 
what this did in this environment was it forced Clement Amonis to uh, evolve a certain defense so that it wouldn't be consumed. And so what the, or the uh, defense it evolved was multicellularity. At first, the Clement Amonis uh, clumped irregularly. So they were their ancestral unicellular. Mm -hmm. And the first step was clumping irregularly. So they would clump in maybe two, maybe eight, maybe 16, maybe 32. But the problem is, or, and so that, that sort of solved the first problem because you have to be large enough to not be eaten by Ocremonis. But it created a second problem because then you have to be able to distribute food equally among all of your cells, right? If, yeah, yeah. if you can't be you know, made of hundreds of cells and then most of them don't eat because then you just die. It doesn't work. Okay. The, little, the little ones, in, just think of like a, a bundle where you've got the outer cells and then the inner cells that don't have access to the food source because the other damn cells are in the way. So right. now that there's a there's now a dynamic limit where what would be the best size and arrangement to do that? Well, you don't have to engineer it; you can just let evolution figure it out. Yeah, the, yeah, it's like and in like, fact they okay, did. We're not getting eaten anymore, but okay, can, can I have some food now? Uh, no, no, now nah, you can you, you can starve. Oh crap! You you starve. We all starve. <laughs> right, basically, yeah. If, if some of us starve, then we're all starving, and you can't have that if you're a multicellular organism. You have to be able to distribute your nutrients effectively. So as RJ said. That, in fact, happened. There, so you had the first predation, the pressure, which was selecting particular mutations, uh, uh, which pushed these organisms, these unicellular organisms, towards multicellularity. So the first pressure pushed them towards being larger. However, there was a second pressure pushing them towards being smaller, and that was being able to distribute resources efficiently, plays USSR national anthem in background. Um, <laughs> So they it, they actually hit the optimum the optimum optimal medium between those. It, it's a, if I re remember yeah, correctly, it was about eight cells. So they went from being irregular, just all over the map, to streamlining for a particular number of cells, which were too large to be eaten, but small enough to distribute resources. And exactly that same thing happens. Here's the big picture thing. Of, of, of an oscillating system that is working against two dissimilar selection pressures, it eventually settles on an optimal one. That's what happens with cheaters versus cooperators in cellular systems, mm -hmm. that the cheater can only go so far without outstaying its welcome. The cooperators can only go so far without having to deal with the existence of the cheater. And this is why we're the operating at yeast, things without brains are doing mm -hmm. this sort of thing. And you eventually end up cycling within a natural range of how that works. Uh, uh, Martin Novak has written tons of stuff on that, super cooperators and all of that, and goes into it in great detail. I think it's just delicious stuff about how complex things and, and plateaus in behavior and structure can come about just by the interaction of multiple mechanisms, selecting for varying things, and that's what you end up with. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, so we have another experiment. This one's slightly older. Uh, this was Ratcliffe 2012. So he evolved, or he and his team evolved Saccharomyces cerevisiae to become multicellular in response to selection by gravity. So this time, so again, it's still mutations. No one's in control of the mutations. It's totally unguided. But these mutations are then selected by the environment, by something in the environment. So this was not predator, 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 for say. Right. So what he did, what Ratcliffe at all did, was they took, was they took the yeast. This this is Baker's yeast, and they identified which ones settle out fastest in a in like a test tube, and then they took the ones who settled out fastest and put them in a new test tube, and the rest were discarded. And so they did this over and over and over. And they found out that, or they realized that certain ones were settling out faster than others. And the reason was they became multicellular. They actually had mutation, which um, uh, caused them to stick together rather to separate. Uh, basically, when the um, the little wall that forms between the, the, the cell membranes, rather than breaking apart, it just stayed. And so they didn't break apart. And so um, they form what were called snowflakes, what, what with this 
team called Snowflakes. And in fact, these are these uh when they were introduced to an environment that didn't have the selective pressure anymore and the lint the uh, unicellular uh lineages never invaded so they stayed multicellular it is a a permanent quote mutation which okay. kind of defies the whole argument that creationists like to show yeah. or like to argue with oh but if you released it back into the wild it wouldn't it would revert back to the original form well it no, would not also necessarily. be of the category of the emergent property of yes. something that emerges in a particular context that wasn't there to begin with, but by natural mutations can end up going there. And then you can also have the other bit, which is kind of a cousin to Cope's rule and various other ideas of the, or not Cope, uh, um, uh, I can't the, the, the irreversibility issue, of oh, whether yeah. some things uh, can only happen. And once they're done, you can't back up. Right. And there are some things in biology that are probably in that thing. It puts you into a constraint where now all of your evolution from that point on is from a step that you are never going to be able to retrace past in, in your mutations. You've crossed that bridge. Right. I, I have two questions. Okay. For each thing. First question: in the from the first in the first experiment, did they ever see? Did they ever see if the predator could adapt the, to the new uh, prey item or not? This, this Not as far as I'm aware. I don't. I don't think they identified any any I think, selective I think that responses. Would be, in that case, my guesstimation would be that the predatory organism has some constraints on how big it can get, and therefore there are limits as to the size of a of a thing that it could go with. And that and that we find in an awful lot of systems where and this will come up in some future slides, so a slight spoiler alert here, <laughs> is the fact that you've got a, a, a dynamic going on, uh, what is an evolutionary arms race between predator and prey, and there are limits to both ends of what either one of them can do, so that's why you don't mm -hmm. have supersonic predators, uh, because there's limitations as to what you can come up with. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so what's the, your uh, second question? As you, if the, the yeast one, do they figure out if if the, if that new yeast can make better better or worse bread? That's a good question. That's you would have to ask one. Dr. Ratcliffe. I, I do not yeah, know the yeah. answer to that Does, one. Is there a taste difference to our taste, which would be the only thing that would matter because we would be the ones selecting on it. Do we, would we have a different preference to yeast that settles quickly or not? Or is it totally irrelevant where our taste buds don't give a rat's ass whether or not I, the yeast uh, falls by gravity faster? I think I think it would be definitely a missed opportunity if they did not like try to make beer immediately after this experiment <laughs> or something. And and this brings up the whole mind of the people who had a lot of time on their hands in the past that figured out how to do things like making beer and domesticating crops and domesticating animals and you know they're, they're kind of seat of the pants naturalists that probably were the oddball that while well, they spend all their time with the damn plants just you know well go in they're really good plants though so there we go. you better tolerate it um, like 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 i don't even i don't know if you mentioned future plants but like past sheep and past uh cows and stuff that they, they were like vicious little creatures until we like like try to make food out of them i mean i would argue some of them are still pretty vicious uh, yeah, and some like animals and some animals that have been semi-domesticated still have enormous limits. Llama are really truculent animals. Camels can be yeah. extremely truculent animals. And so there's just, there's kind of a boundary layer as to what they'll tolerate you doing with them <laughs> in a way that other animals are much more compliant. And it's, and it's probably the case that certain cultures have been restricted by the amenability of their domesticated animals uh, in the environment, the fact that there were no horses in the New World uh, prior, uh, even though they evolved in America, uh, they eventually were extinct there. And so cultures could go in a different direction. Those sort of animals, draft animals and that, horses were domesticated for, for pulling things before anybody thought to ride them. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like, 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 into that. like, like they, were, they were more for chariots than they were for actually Calvary yeah. for the longest time. And in fact, given how big a horse is, and the fact that the stirrup wasn't invented, again, not by the Romans or anything, but out in Asia, uh, that um, it was not an immediate idea to get up on top of that and run around on your own rather than just let it pull a, week, a wagon. Right. 
Exactly. Um, so the there are two other things I wanted to mention about this experiment, which I find very interesting. Is one, um, there was a the hallmark of division of, of or sorry the hallmark of, of complex multicellularity was observed. They had they displayed division of labor. Some of the uh, cells would, if it started forming a new colony on one of the cells, it would actually uh, undergo apoptosis on one of the cells, so it would kill it off. Meaning, therefore, it would not pass its genes on. Hmm. Uh, but the other thing is about this, um, they were clonal. All multicellular, all complex multicellular organisms are clonal. And so you had complex multicellularity in the form of, of, of division of labor and uh, clonal uh, development. So you have, these are organisms who are definitely multicellular from definitely unicellular forms. And that, which leads me to the second thing is that over in intelligent design land, poor old Jonathan <laughs> Wells attempted to take a pot shot at, uh, I don't think it was this experiment per se. I think it was a different one along sort of the same lines. Cause there've been a bunch of experiments like this in the past, mm -hmm. but he tried to take a pot shot at it by saying, well, actually Saccharomyces is ancestral or ancestrally can be either unicellular or multicellular eh, wrong. Uh, so what they do, what, what, Saccharomyces will do sometimes is they'll form biofilms where it's a whole bunch of individuals who are not genetically related and they will do this thing called flock type aggregation. They'll use their, their membrane proteins to stick to each other basically and they'll form a little biofilm. That's cool. It's not at all relevant to ah, this experiment. Flock style aggregation is what happens to the brains of people at the Discovery Institute. <laughs> that, that, is, that is in fact the case, RJ, yes. Um, but yeah, so no no division of labor in the flock in the flock type aggregation, no clonal multicellularity, none of that, not at all relevant. And in fact, one of the really funny things he did was he actually took a picture like this, one of the snowflake pictures, and he posted it and said, "This is the ancestral form." No, no. this is the new form. But of you mean Jonathan did. Wells misrepresenting sources? I'm shocked. Shocked. I know. Can't gasp. Gasp. So, yeah, can't you uh, hear me gasping? Yeah, a gasping for air. Yeah. So, we good on this one? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And, and uh, you'll notice that, that as we move up these layers and layers and layers, we're inevitably starting to get more and more detailed into the things that are doing the thing. Because what we're dealing with ultimately are organisms in populations, which means lots of critters. Yes, yes, lots and lots of critters. So here, um, we are going back again. So we kind of we kind of left um, genetics. We were looking more at the morphology side of it. So now we're kind of coming back, back to the genetic side of it. Uh, so when I hear someone like Michael B, he make the argument that uh, there's no actual novelty uh, organisms only lose structures to get more <laughs> complex when he makes an argument like that he's just dead wrong it's just totally bogus backwards from how we actually understand phylogenies to work um, so in both these are both instances in which you had genetic or you had gene duplications which resulted in novel features or at least in part were assisting in the novel features so on your left, we have a 2020 paper, uh, which uh, you have the uh, adjusted alignment for. It, it's easier if you look at the one on the right because they're all lined up the same as opposed to the left one. Um, and so you have a micro duplication. If you see, there's a little box missing. Those are all bats, but the everything. So the top three, it's homo. So humans, uh, cows and dogs. And then you have bats. Bats are all the other ones. And so there's a little box there. And that represents the loss of a microduplication, which is uh, the amino acids Y, S, E, and R. And I don't remember which those are. Sue me. Um, <laughs> but, but that microduplication was lost in a particular group of, of old world bats, old world fruit bats. And as a result, they can no longer echolocate. But at, that microduplication also doesn't exist in their closest relatives. So it was gained in bats and then lost in certain groups. And so as a result, bats like Rusetus have had to actually develop a different type of echolocating mechanism 
to compensate for that. They because clip their there's tongue. a selection pressure for echolocation. So, yeah. So, like, like the fruit bat, like, just like, say, say the fruit bats don't need echolocation because the fruit, the fruit doesn't run away. But bats that hit on insects and other things do need it because their prey can run well, away. Well, yes, but also some of the fruit bats. I mean, that is correct. Yes, they don't actually need it because a lot of them focus on fruit, but some of them do also eat insects in in okay. addition, like Rusetus. Uh, which is why they have independently developed a different type of echolocation where they click their tongues really fast instead of laryngeal echolocation, which is what all the other bats do who, who have um, echolocating abilities. Now, remember, there would have been already a now dormant neurological processing system to handle clicks and acoustic signals in that way that yes. all it needed was for a mutation to start feeding in information again from a different route and they already have the stuff to deal with it yes that is correct yeah but it's also different but it's also kind of different kind of like when when we went back to the like 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 for example on our our last podcast we, we went, or two years ago we went back to the water our, our the things we got are different from the what we were before when we were fit fish the 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 man, the like the seal, like the like seals and the yeah. whales are totally their their limbs in the water are different, even yes. though, and it's no coincidence water. that whales and not other mammals uh, have evolved in uh, to go back into the water because their ancestors are damn good at, at breathing through their nose and holding holding their breath. Yes, um, and in yeah and. Yes, this is all a very good introduction to the concept of phylogenetic constraints, where your ancestry determines what ecologies you can fill, what ecological niches you can fill. And so in the case of bats, they have really small skulls. As a result, they had small eyes. Um, and this put them on the path towards being able to um, identify prey using a form other than sight. And so, in fact, the early bat fossils, they don't have um, the the ability to laryngeally echolocate. Like on and so... Yeah, they're almost there, but... They're not, almost there. Got, yeah. It, 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 it's all micro-revolutionary as to how that goes. We'd love to have a better fossil record for bats. The other thing to remember on bats, the earliest bats are damned small. The earliest fossil yes. bats would fit in your palm of your hand and have a lot of room left over. Oh, probably yes, they yeah, could be saved. For, probably could be saved for earlier, earlier pterodactyl species too, pterosaur species. Yeah, that's true. Um, we only find these guys in in logger stock, right? Yeah, only although very, the, very fine. The earliest pterosaurs were giants, in comparison to the earliest bats. The earliest pterosaurs were about the size of a crow, and, yeah, but, and yeah. that's way yeah. bigger already. But uh, and, up, the, yeah. and the earliest, the Ramphorhynchids, uh, all stay within that kind of mode. And you only start seeing those giant pterodactyls coming into the fore when bum bum bum. You start also seeing the earliest birds, and there's still an ongoing issue of to what extent did pterosaurs go off in a different selection mode because they started getting competition from the new dinosaur flyers that weren't there before. And what's really puzzling is that. Given the fact that the genetic data keeps implying that bats developed before the KT extinction, even though the earliest fossils are 10 or 15 million years later, if that was right. the case, I would be thrilled ecologically because there would be a time when pterosaurs, bats, and birds were all flying at the same time, if so. And that yeah. is really interesting ecologically. Triple A triple threat uh, match. Yeah. Well, uh, well, also, RJ, our split from... Um, the, the split of the primates was around the K, the KPG extinction. So you could also have Kalugos also flying around yeah. at the same time. <laughs> or yeah, gliding and, around and, the same and time. It's, yeah. the, that's the, what we've just done here is a level of cross-connection, of thinking about different taxa living simultaneously in an ecological environment that will never occur in a creationist brain. No, no, it no. will not. I've been looking. Um, I haven't spotted any sign of it. Right. So, so that's, uh, so that's that group. You have micro duplication in one particular lineage, which is the chiropterans, the bats. And then that micro duplication was lost in a particular group. Hence why they no longer have echolocation. Now, if you look to the group on the right, so Red boxes, 
Yep, big red boxes. So the first, the very top one, uh, the very top um, strand is the trypsinogen gene. So trypsinogen is involved in breaking down uh, trypsin, which is an uh, an amino acid, and it's and so this trypsinogen protein. There's a little segment of it which is only, um, I think it's nine. So it's, I think it's just ten nucleotides in length. It's three, three codons, so nine. And then I think the one, the little yellow, is just one letter. I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, which is, which um, is from a an a information point of view, really small. Yes, it's a very, very small segment because I think the trypsinogen protein is like over a thousand nucleotides in length, and so this is just like 10 of them. So very, very tiny. And it's just the front kind of end of, of part of it. So there's a group of fish called ice fish and uh, notothenioids, boreogatus. Those are both groups of ice fish. Well, in the Cenozoic, uh, it's around 40 million years ago or so, uh, the, the continents had split up such that now you had a different um, current circling the Antarctic which was causing it to get colder. Yeah. Yep, drastically cooling the Antarctic. Uh, well, in, in the world by by proxy. Yeah. But and so part of the reason, so part of the thing was for these fish, the notothenioids and the Arctic cod, was you have to survive in an environment that's getting progressively colder. And so what happened for these guys was they took a this little segment. Of course, unconsciously, they didn't think about doing this is just what happened you had a fish which was born with a a um a segment of the trypsinogen protein had been duplicated and then was being read by uh rna polymerase and was being made into a little amino acid sequence which could then be folded into a protein and so it got duplicated and it duplicated and duplicated and duplicated and this was selected for because it conferred resistance against being frozen in your progressively uh, chilling environment. It, it formed what's called an antifreeze glycoprotein. That's what AFGP stands for. And so there we have the selective pressure, the cooling oceans, and we have the novelty, the AFGP, via mutation, the gene duplicate, the micro duplication, basically. So we have this is, and this is all microevolution, right? Yeah. It's just it's just and selection those sorts on of mutations are occurring all across the history of life. If you imagine a duplication that duplicates a piece and it's a problem, and any change in the molecule really is a problem, those <laughs> self-edit. They become the X's on the map because mm -hmm. they, they immediately get edited out of the system. They don't have to have any worry about it. <clears> but so if you have a system where the one duplication is a little bit beneficial and another duplication is a little more beneficial, then the other dynamic that, that is still open question is to what extent would there be preferential mutations that would occur because the constraints on making that duplication are a little bit different from one segment of the DNA versus another, and that's well, that's a higher level analysis. That's, I guess, I guess that would depend, maybe depend if how fast it's freezing, the water's freezing out there. Well, this is before you even get to yeah. that stage. This is huh. merely in the process of, of generating the the various gene duplications and variations uh, before selection even gets onto it. That that's a, then a different environment as to temperature gradients and what it seems likely has happened with with the many times that antifreeze proteins have developed is mm -hmm. that the fish develops this in a benign context and its range expands because they can get along better in colder environments. And then some of them finally move off into the point where now they're basically adapted to cold and they no longer have a range in where it used to be warm. And sometimes some of the molecules will mutate to the point where they really are stuck in a cold environment now. Right. Yeah. Two, que oh, two questions is, one is that one guy's name pronounced like the character, like the book character, the book and the character in movies. Ooh, do uh, what? Do Doolittle. Yeah, yeah, Doctor Doolittle. Yeah, I think all of them are pronounced Doolittle. There's a couple of different Doolittles in science. Oh, as, yeah, um, yes. Yeah. There, there's uh, oh, um, 
One of them is four Doolittle, and then there is a different yeah. Doolittle. So you encounter there's, a couple of them, but they're all Doolittles. There's, there's one in, uh, yeah, so this guy, I don't know what his, I, I guess it's, he's just an ichthyologist. But yeah, the, the four Doolittle, he's big into like origin of life stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah. But definitely can't talk to animals. And not one of them talks to animals, okay. as far as I know. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> and, and, and two, uh, also off topic, but I heard that if we could no, if ever get fossils off of Antarctica, we can do it now, but we, we might find some uh, proto-marsupial ancestors there from the, crossing over from South America. Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. oh, you're, you're jumping ahead. Okay. Jumping ahead, uh, Lamont. We'll get there. We'll get there. I didn't, yeah. I didn't see. I, I, I didn't even know the thing. I'm just, my brain's already I know. going fast well, forward. And, and it stands to reason because the marsupials, we know marsupials ended up in Australia. And initially, Australia was parked next to Antarctica, and that was parked next to Africa and South America. And gradually, they were pulling apart. So just uh, <laughs> as the dinosaur paleontologists are able to anticipate what dinosaurs were in Antarctica, based on what is known between South American and Australian fauna, ditto goes for all of the uh, marsupials. And so yes. you can interpolate, and not only for that, but also plants, who wear plant biologists. Now, needless to say, uh, excavating in Antarctica, for example, what fossils might there be at the foot of Mount Erebus, buried underneath a mass of ice and the end of it sticking up and doing <laughs> volcanic right. activity every once in a while, uh, we don't know because there's a mountain of ice on top of it. And unfortunately, thanks to global warming, there will be less ice on there and it will be opening up more areas for exploration in, in the future. Right. And in fact, we will return to discussing marsupials. So we will we'll get back to that, Lamont. Don't don't you worry about yeah. it. Um, yeah, the two big ones so, are, okay. I'll just say on the Doolittle front, I have my bibliography open in my other computer, W4 Doolittle and Russell Doolittle. Russell Doolittle is one on blood clotting and uh, all that kind of stuff in fibrinogen. Okay. He pops up in Michael gotcha. Behe's context in a different way than W4 uh, does uh, in relation to phylogenetics. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a really interesting, that whole bit with the fibrinogen, and in fact, researchers predicted um that like sea cucumbers should have a version of fibrinogen related to R and oh look at that they do and then re and the the intelligent design people are like eh who cares it's like well, basically uh, they move we care <laughs> to where B yeah. who was making a big deal out of that back in the 1990s it's not as big of a hot topic unless you encountered some parasitical anti evolutionist who's only read Darwin uh, uh, the Darwin's black box and doesn't know about the last 25 years of research. <laughs> well, I mean, there are quite a lot of them, to be fair. True. Uh, we got a bug however, testing natural selection. We got a bug, yes. So, as, so as now, our... so, 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 sorry. So, so now we're going away from what we want to see in things to what nature does it all by itself. Bingo. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's what, um, yeah, with the last slide, um, this was all, the last slide we looked at was also um, how we can tie novelties directly to um selective pressures but in the 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 last example we, we talked about with the bats and the, the ice fish those were natural examples so that was sort of our we were going from novelty under our experiments the which clementimonis the and gateway examples right those are our gateway examples to now we're going to talk about this is all just happening in nature we have nothing to do with this whatsoever so um and that's what brings us here so uh, with this example, so this little bug is is called a water strider. The, this, and there's a bunch of water striders, so the genus is Ragavalia. Now, the cool thing about Ragavalia is it had it also had a duplicated gene. So its gene called Mother of Geisha was duplicated, and the duplicated version was called Geisha, or is called Geisha. And Geisha makes these little fans, the ones that are on its second uh, pair of arms. They cute. Yep, those are its fans, and it uses those to propel itself across fast-moving water. Its relatives, its closest relatives, like Stradulavalia, do not have the duplicated fan, do not have the duplicated genes, therefore they don't have the fans, therefore they can't cross the water. And researchers found out, researchers thought, hmm, do, do the fans uh, have an adaptive advantage when they're not at full fan size? What, what is the good of half a fan? 
<laughs> you know, you've probably heard that argument. What good is half an eye, half a wing, whatever? Well, it turns out, actually, yeah, half a fan is still adaptively beneficial. It still means you can move faster. You can still move on moving water. You still uh, can turn uh, better than your closest relatives. And so, they yes. determine this by... You know, by, by doing it, by they partially knocked out the fan, the genes causing the fan. So they stunted the development and then let these little guys uh, out in uh, this little uh, uh, race sort of thing, um, this little experiment. They simulated a river and they let them go and they saw which one, which ones could move faster, which, which ones could turn better and all that. And, they, and yes, in fact, Ragavalia with a partial fan is still better than Stradulavalia with no fan. Yeah, they don't have to guess at it. It's, you can measure it. Yeah. And so that's testing natural selection. It's it's things are they're not going to be harmful un until they're useful. They're either be not harmful or useful at all stages until they become useful. Ooh, we got some chat. David Neff's in the chat. Oh, welcome David Neff. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, I I hopped over to Erica's Erica's stream and said hi. We're we'll waiting for Erica to start streaming her game. Come over and say <laughs> hi. <laughs> oh, well, good. So, uh, are we good on this slide? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So now with our gateway to <laughs> natural selection. Um, <laughs> let's take a couple a couple other examples. Now, I'm sure everyone's uh, familiar with the one the on classic. the left, the classic peppered moth experiment originally by well and then later by Michael Majerus and creation have a very funny relationship with this experiment because but, in but Jackson print, no new information has been the thing they're still moths they're, they're always been black or white right right yeah. we we'll, <laughs> right we'll get there so in principle there's nothing about this this example that is counter to creationism so you can have mutations and natural selection and still have young earth creationism. And they recognize this because the creationists argue this too. As you said, they can just say, well, sure, it's still a moth. It's still in the moth kind, right? Whatever the heck that means. But they can still say that. But they chose not to go that route. They chose instead to make the argument that these moths don't actually land on trees. And that this oh, wasn't oh, actually oh, the, oh, the, oh, due the to old, mutation and selection. Oh, yeah, and thereby the, hangs a tail. Oh, was this? Was, it, was this? It, was, sorry, was this the? Oh, that they they glued the moss on the thing argument. Yeah, that was it, part of it. Yeah, that, that yeah. there was a, a cottage industry of moth nutballs uh, around two thousand. Uh, Jonathan Wells, uh, Hooper, and a few others were just going ballistic about this, trying to dismiss it. And the reason why they were paying so much attention to it is because it was a completely natural interaction, a non-designed reaction to pollution. So it was hitting two problems at the same time. The idea that a natural process without any guidance could change the moths from white to black or back again. And mm -hmm. the environmentalism issue that if we put out too much soot, it's changing the environment in ways that organisms are adapting to and not necessarily in good ways. So the, the, right. the hyper conservatism of anti-evolutionism and their obsessions about environmentalism made this a double whammy thing. And it happened to be that, that, that the late Jarrus had alluded to the, um, the various experiments that were done. And he was the first one that raised the point that Kettlewell's experiments back in the 50s had some um, relatively minor uh, technical issues about whether or not they were rigorously establishing selection or not. And immediately mm -hmm. a cascade of misrepresentation took place, partly done by Jerry Coyne, who riffed off of Majerus's book. And he insisted, oh, that maybe only one or two uh, moths are ever seen on trees. Ironically, Coyne was wrong. Majerus actually found about a quarter of the uh, moths that he had spotted landing on trees naturally. And Jonathan Wells riffed off of coin to turn two into one. So he just extrapolated and they went amuck with it. And well, Majerus got really pissed off uh, about how his work was being misrepresented. So he decided to replicate the Kettlewell study, except plugging all of the methods holes that he had brought up and 
they started doing that. He actually died before the experiment was completed, but nonetheless, it successfully replicated kettle well, which is why anybody that brings up the peppered moth and as a problem for evolution is probably riffing off of 2000 wells and not paying attention to current material. Precisely. Yes, that's a very good uh, summary of what occurred with this. And it's it's very funny that I it is funny, in my opinion, that they chose that the creationists chose to, like, take the hardest route in yeah. attacking this rather than just being like, OK, it's minor variation, whatever. It's still a moth. It's just yeah, a little bit cares. Yeah, and, and, but they didn't. They completely flipped the table on it, which is just so funny in my yeah. opinion. In part because it was such an icon. It was used all the time. It was the classic illustration. And remember, the vast majority of creationists are lazy bastards. They don't yeah. really study much about the literature. If it's something that makes it into the textbook or a Richard Dawkins book or something like that, well, then they just attack it like nobody's business but if it had been just in obscure technical journals it was only popping up in the journal of stuff nobody ever cites uh right. nobody would be bothering about it right and in fact that's that's kind of what's happening in our in our next one mm -hmm. um so the example now it's more obscure but in my opinion no less interesting so because again this one kind of hits a whole bunch of creationist misconceptions all at once uh, so this is uh, Ferguson all 2013. So what they were doing is and actually I discussed most of these experiments in a video uh, I did call it experimental evolution part one. So go on my channel, check that out if you want to hear more about these in depth. Um, so with this experiment, Pseudomonas fluorescens is a bacterium. Now it normally occurs in what's called the smooth morph. That's SM there on the, on the left, but the smooth morph can undergo mutations which cause it to form different morphologies either the wrinkly morph which is ws or the fuzzy morph which is fs so the cool thing about these morphotypes is to go from one to the other you can't just have if you're going from wrinkly to fuzzy you can't just have one mutation to go from one to the other you actually have to have two mutations the reason is you have to go back to smooth and then to the other one so the um the uh, um, genome size of of uh, Pseudomonas is about six million base pairs, and so if we're doing creationist math here, it's six million you know squared. One in six million squared is the probability of of this occurring, right? Oh, totally impossible. Uh, well, no, actually, it's not. Uh, so when the researchers were doing this experiment to figure out what the likelihood of them switching is, they found it occurred in about half of their experiments. <laughs> so less, you know, slightly greater than impossible, right? <laughs> Always beware of creationists trying to weigh big improbability numbers. They're most probably misrepresentations. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they're almost certainly misrepresentations. Mm -hmm. um, but the cool thing about, about this one is, or another cool thing about it is, uh, wrinkly morph is preferable to fuzzy morph. Um, the fuzzy morphs generally form these little transient rafts on top of the broth, and then they sink. They get too heavy, they sink. The wrinkly morph doesn't have this problem. Which, However, which goes back to that thing about multicellularity and how the dynamics of things are coming into play. Yes, exactly. However, uh, to have our second, um, our second selective pressure, it turns out that the fuzzy morph is not, uh, or is immune, I should say. The fuzzy morph is immune to a bacteriophage, whereas the wrinkly morph is not. Bingo. So you have an arms race where if you have the smooth population, well, first, you're going to have, of course, a, a it's going to become wrinkly and fuzzy originally, but the wrinklies are going to outcompete the fuzzies because they are favored fitness-wise. However, introduce a bacteriophage, and you're going to have an increase in fuzzies. However, as the fuzzies return and the bacteriophages run out of things to eat, their population is going to dwindle and the wrinklies are going to return. And so you have this back and forth, an, an adaptive arms race, an evolutionary arms race between the wrinkly and the fuzzy morphs. And this is exactly what Ferguson et al. identified. Yeah. So, and now imagine, imagine a, a branch of that bacterium 
that found it really difficult to do that hopscotch back to the one versus the other, or very difficult to generate those two mutations. Well, what would happen to them? Bye. <laughs> and they get right. read out of the system. So what at a higher level, what you're selecting for is a level of open-ended adaptability that those organisms over the long term will probably tend to survive better because they can adapt more easily to altering conditions. Yep, exactly. Um, any more questions on this slide? Nope, and, and at least now I, I can see the chat as well, so I can keep a little eyeball on them to see what pops up. And I think uh, I'll, so, I'll I, not I do the same thing. Question, quick question, real fast. Yes, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know if you're going to talk about this in the future. In the future slide, you might, you might, but I about the what was that the the nylon eating bacteria or something that the, the oh, uh, we can talk about that briefly. Um, so okay. uh, I don't have a slide on it because okay, th there are a billion. I think examples. we mentioned it briefly in in Slam Dunk too. Good excuse to sell the book. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, yeah. We mentioned it in Rock, and uh, the rocks were there. So, you know, the rocks were there. Yeah. Um, where you have a point mutation in a bacterium, nylon does not occur naturally in the environment. It, it is, is a man-made product. Invented. Yes, it is a it is a human-made product. Ergo, it did not exist in the environment. It was not there. But you have, and it is now in the. Um, it is now in the environment for these bacteria and they developed a way to metabolize it. They, they developed a pro, an enzyme called nylonase so they can degrade the, uh, the polymer, which makes up nylon, uh, which like I said, it didn't exist. This is a novel selective now, pressure. It's a variation uh, on the capacities to deal with certain kinds of molecules. And so the creationists yes. will then go to dodge. Well, it's not really new information. It's doing something different. But it's not new enough for us. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, then comes down to a, a gradient because as we saw with the bats and with the ice fish earlier, yeah. well, where do you draw the line? Because we have new functions. And with this, with the nylonase example, we have new functions coming from things which, I mean, yes, the organism existed, the, the population existed, but the function of this enzyme didn't exist. It, it required a point mutation to change its function so it could do this new job. If that's not new, I don't lane. know what is. Uh, I think Hello, a TV. similar thing occurs, and, uh, and I'm running just off my memory here, but I believe in Hawaii, there's a thing where some flies have either adapted to, to eating or pollinating introduced fruit that were only brought to the islands in the last like 100 years or so. And so they, they're, they're adapting to it in novel ways that weren't there to begin with. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I'm not. I'm not familiar with it, but I really wouldn't be surprised. By yeah, it. I think it was in Hawaii, but it was a, because it was in an island population, and and it's buried somewhere in my memory. That but anyway, somebody with an anal retentive obsession to fact check, which I hope there's some people watching <laughs> the show that do that. Jackson, uh, uh, hunt into that. Yeah, but no, right. Jackson, our intelligent designer knew that that bacteria we would invent nylon someday, so, so he put that That's information in, 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 the, in, in the thing. That's partly how creationists play this. Yeah. That God, the omniscient, knew about the fall of man and mm. knew about all these. And so some of these things were intended uh, from the get-go. And if it's beneficial, they'll uh, take that argument. Now, if it's not beneficial, if it's a terribly dangerous bacterium, then they'll say, oh, that's due to the fall. That right. the original thing, like the cholera example we discussed in uh, Slam Dunk, uh, that, that was originally benign and sweet, and it only got to be that way because we came in and gummed up the works. And, you know, this is a tails you win, kids I lose uh, kind of situation. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so another example of, of uh, novelty, you know, via mutations under selection. So, so this example, so as we had a gateway, <laughs> gateway with the <laughs> last example, now I can't not, I can't not think about that, RJ. Yeah. Yes, I was uh, going to say first, gateway drug, but this ain't drugs. Well, we've already introduced you to the the uh, cocaine of of evolution. Now we're introducing you to the heroin of evolution. So yeah, yeah, getting <laughs> yeah. into the really heavy stuff. So, um, so 
this example with the pseudomonas introduced, or well, it didn't introduce it. It reinforced the concept of an evolutionary arms race. Well, so natural selection is all about arms races, as is sexual selection. These are both all about evolutionary arms races because organisms don't evolve in a vacuum. It's not like you evolve an adaptation and then suddenly all your predators disappear. No, they evolve in response. They have their own set of selective pressures, some of which bear on you and some of your selective pressures bear on them. And so you have a back and forth dynamic, which is constantly going on until one of you goes extinct or both of you. And so what we see here, and so this, these are sort of classic examples of evolutionary arms races. We have the gazelle and the cheetah, right? Both have to be fast enough to escape and fast enough to catch the other one. And so, um, I can't remember who it was. Someone, it was, I think it was some biologist was like, whose side is God on? You know, is it the lion or the gazelle? Uh, yeah, and, and you can model theoretically the organisms and the populations of organisms. And, and, and you can find so many different evasive techniques. One is running. Another one is dodging, changing course correction. We'll be getting mm -hmm. into examples of that as well. The, the predator has the difficulty because it's got to catch a lot of meat because the action of of, of a predator is high energy intensive. So there's a cost benefit ratio going on differently. There are times when if it runs far enough and it goes to the point where this is not worth it, let the gazelle go. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, and so uh, and so here we have, the, we have these back and forth adaptations in both species as they compete for certain available resources or their very own lives. And this is this is how natural selection works. I'll go get some show and tell. Be back in a second. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> um, so while he's gone, um, the other example is the cuckoo, which is here on the right. And the cuckoo is what's known as a brood parasite. So it lays its eggs in the nests of other birds and has those other birds rear its own offspring. So the cool thing is. There are other birds, the ones who are parasitized more often, come to recognize cuckoo eggs as opposed to birds which are parasitized less often. They can't normally recognize the cuckoo eggs, and so they raise it. Um, but birds which live in large flocks, which have to be able to identify their own offspring, are at an advantage because they, they will see, okay, this is my egg, this is my chick versus this is not my egg or my chick and so they will not be susceptible yeah. to brood parasites yeah i i guess for that that the thing the uh the cuckoo would have to make it figure out how to make an egg close or find the species whose eggs is closest to their their eggs or not aha in fact that does happen or well it, it's uh, sort of um so what they do is yeah so they parasitize a bird and the bird can then recognize this is not my egg. So what the cuckoos do is the ones whose eggs are more similar to that bird, those are the ones whose eggs get reared. And oh. so they're being selected by the other bird by accident. Yeah. Uh, you can actually uh, look up uh, or Google brood parasitism, and you can find out the, the dynamics of what's going on in there. And the one place you don't find brood parasitism are in birds that have gigantic flocks where there are umpteen thousand of the bird, each with their mm -hmm. own little nest. And it means the bird has to be really good at finding baby right. amidst all the other babies. And it turns out brood parasitism is really terrible to pull off. Show yeah. and tell, I brought a, a nice Hold on. little- Hold let me, RJ, let me stop screen sharing so you can show. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, a nice little uh, a jaguar model versus a gazelle. And the fact that what you see is the difference between a stalker and a runner, that the limb proportions are very distinctive. They stand out like a sore thumb. And, and therefore, anybody looking at the limb proportions, one of the reasons why they know that tyrannosaurs were not run the prey down is because their limb proportions are wrong, as opposed to other dinosaurs that have limb proportions like a, 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 a so, cheetah. So the, that the, the, means they're fast runners. So, so did that tell from those limbs there are, there are natural constraints, and you can apply the measurements of what we do in our environment to an extinct organism. 
So did right. that did that gazelle use natural selection to look like the cheetah so they can blend in without being eaten? So, <laughs> oh well, yeah, that's the other factor is their environment. Well, the grass, yeah, they, they look like the grass. Well, no, I, 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 no, I, I, sorry, I was making a joke about how that gazelle was another cheetah. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, well, then, and then you get into niche partitioning and all the different dynamics and and how big the animal is. Uh, uh, if you can bring down a bigger animal versus a smaller animal, you get more meal. But it's mm -hmm. maybe harder to do that with than the larger animal that they may be in herds and maybe truculent yeah. they may have tusks and so now you get oh, yeah. all these what you have in all of these calculations it's way more than just the gazelle versus the uh, cheetah is that you have a whole uh -huh. layer on layer on layer of things multi-dimensional in mathematical yeah. context and that's why it that's why zoologists can earn a living because it's not easy work to figure ding, out ding. All the strengths. <laughs> yeah like, like, like some in the big box jackson yeah, it's like some, yeah. predators, some predators work together in groups. Other ones are solo artists. Sometimes yes. we have prey that wander off or whatever. Yeah. whatever they, and they there too, there is a there is a whole social dynamic that play, comes into play between solitary predators versus cooperative predators. So now you have the dynamic, and how many of those relate to whether or not they have harem structures in terms of their the mating practices which brings us into sexual selection so it, it it's a an intricate thing nature is not obliged to be tidy it's only right. obliged to be natural exactly so uh we good on this slide yeah okay. get us a, a screen share again okay get rid of my uh, mug. Okay. it should it should be i, I should oh, be I, screen sharing right now there we go. I, I have to do it i guess oh okay i'm sorry sorry about that okay so um so yes so Evolutionary arms races are all over the place. They occur between all sorts of organisms, and, and even and, as a and even within the, and even I don't want to say this or not, but even within it, even within its, its its own species too. Yes, correct. Yes, not only with your environment, and the other organisms in your environment, but you also have arms races against your against other members of your own species for limited mates, and this has resulted. In a truly staggering variety of of uh, organism weaponry. So here on this one, these are uh, uh, pictures from a uh, paper, uh, Emlyn, uh, 2008, which is a review on animal weaponry. And so in the picture on the top left, we have trilobites with various sorts of weaponry. Now, some of these are for protecting themselves. Some are for um, their particular niche. Some are for... Uh, advertising it to mates. They're for all sorts of different things, but the point is they all evolved as uh, in under natural selection and under sexual selection. These were mutations that were selected in particular directions. Uh, below them, that okay, be Jackson, that, you can't fool me. The designer likes spiky things. I mean, that's entirely possible, but is it parsimonious? <laughs> I would argue not. Oh uh, no, it could be that way. <laughs> Um, it could it could be God just has a thing for you know BDSM or whatever. I mean that's entirely possible, yeah. I guess. But there we go. Um, well, there you could make an argument. <laughs> you could make the argument, yes. Um, uh, so we have so un, so A is is the trilobites group. B those are isopods and amphipods with all sorts of of pinchers and spines for you know for capturing prey or for advertising or for defense. Then group C below that, those are different crabs and lobsters and shrimp who have yeah. a variety of different uh, arm sizes. Uh, Including asymmetrical or, one, one where, where only one yes. of the limbs is gigantic. Yeah. Yep, as in the fiddler crab there, uh, who's kind yeah. of sort of in the middle there, uh, which is real cool. I like him, I yeah. like fiddler crabs. Um, then over here on the left side, you, or sorry, on the right side, you have a bunch of beetles, a lot of a lot of scarab beetles there, which hold a special place in my heart. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have all sorts of different horns. Most of them are, are a lot of them probably for sexual selection or for competition between males. As it happens in um, the, uh, the the scarab beans, the dung beetles, the ones with uh, horns are the ones who are tunnelers. So they, they dig tunnels under the, the uh, feces and then bring it down into their their tunnel, and so they compete with other males by having a sort of tug of war or push of war, and you push the other male out of your tunnel so you can secure your females. 
And uh, you kind of have to do this. You have to have a disproportionate access to females because otherwise you don't justify the cost of having a gigantic horn on your head, which costs material in development and time in development. And yet you're so, instantly displaying oh, your your strength. <laughs> Look how strong I have to be to carry around all this shit. Yeah, I've heard about that too. <laughs> Basically, so, yeah. Yeah, I also heard about that too. Like so, some things it, like th something may look good on you or whatever, but then it takes away from other things in your system that like, that have the balance out. Like you can't be super strong, yeah. but also super fa fast, whatever. Like, like yeah, like, that's called example. Sorry, like for example, we our physical answers used to have armor, but then we decided for protection, we decide we would like speed better than armor, so they got rid of the armor for more speediness and swiftness and stuff. Yeah, that actually has a name. It's called uh, the Havy's Principle, if I remember correctly. And so the, the, the point is basically you or the, the Handicap Principle, that's another term for it, is if you're yeah. going to have big armor or something like that, you have to justify the cost. Yeah, uh, it, or, And it's or, interesting or, yeah, how like that. comparatively rare it is. Uh, and it is revealing that, that the heavily armored placoderms, for example, uh, are in the early stages of fish evolution, and they kind of, they're not all that useful from that point on. You do get um, uh, late stage stuff in the dinosaurs with the super armored ank ankylosaurs, but then again, they're all mm -hmm. extinct. Yeah, like once once we got the jaw, right. we, we can fight back like, huh, we can actually eat the other things now. We don't have to worry about getting eaten anymore. So pff, screw this armor. <laughs> and, and oh, and by the way, I, I, um, I really want to mention the, the most ingenious and eccentric example of that arms race thing in relation to moths and bats before we get into two more into the armor area. Because yeah, one of my ahead. favorite examples is how the bat sends out its acoustic waves and the moth can start detecting that and realizing that it's a bats nearby. And some moth species have developed a counter jamming that sends out a signal that distorts the way the thing is so that it miss targets. But then Isn't that's a developed a compensating um, mechanism to process that and to get around that. And then the ultimate is that because the bat is a big flyer coming down on the moth, some moths have figured out how to do an immediate drop where they suddenly lose lift, drop down, and the bat flies right past them because it's targeted <laughs> them perfectly, but it can't turn on a dime. I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard I heard the the moth things because there, there's like a, a like a maybe like a parasite or something in, in its ear and doesn't want to get eaten by the bats because it will die too. And that there's actually a, a bunch of different techniques, and that also brings up a bit. But when you have a selection pressure in an armed race, bat wants to eat moth. Moth does not want to be eaten. It's not conscious, <laughs> right. but that's just how it works out. Now you have multiple potential opportunities for the arms race to go and it will tend to occur convergently with different modalities in different species combinations because the, the mutations themselves unless there's a selection and a likelihood for them genetically and that's relatively rare it's that different routes will arrive at similar solutions because there's the selection mm -hmm. pressure but not the mechanism right yep so we we get on this one because there's another i have yeah. basically like three slides which are sort of similar pictures and so we can okay. kind of yeah Keep going over this this same principle of evolutionary arms races. Uh, top uh, top left, those are all different fish with various. Uh, you mentioned the armored placoderm, so there's one with this large um, kind of spine pointing up on it. There's like cephalaspis or something like that. Uh, you have some sharks, some sawfish, the, the paddlefish, uh, swordfish, all sorts of different little critters. Uh, group B, those are all tetrapods, uh, all. And so you have dinosaurs, you have various theropods, and um, you have Pachycephalosaur, Ankylosaurs, Ceratopsians. Uh, you also have um, here on sort of where B is, if you go directly across to the top right of that group, you yeah. have the amphibian Diplocolis, which has that triangular head. There's some sort of uh, Lystrosaur with its tusks. Yes, so um, are we are we getting right in the, are these images right here? Are we getting the more of the natural slash selection crossovers for that could be used for natural defense or whatever, but also be used the, the, the for mates and stuff? Yes, yeah. These these evolutionary arms races, as because they occur both with between and um, outside of populations, so these things can be used for either defense or for attracting mates, depending yeah. on which particular thing it is. 
some of them and can be doing both fulfill the same, the same role. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Some might be if you have a big a big nose horn like in these rhinos over on on the right side, that could provide some pretty good defense, but also might be favored sexually by the females. And Same for the elephants they, with their tusks. They, they betray their phylogeny. Uh, that when you look at ceratopsids uh, and the ankylosaurs, two uh, heavily uh, spiked or armored organisms, those are developing way, the earliest forms you see in things like that are uh, uh, Scalidosaurus back in the Jurassic, I think, that looks mm -hmm. like a, a slightly lumpy lizard with little scoots along its side. So what you have then is the biological capacity to form filaments and fragments and bumpy yeah. parts. And now and, you can go in a, a bunch of different directions to where you have the tank-like approach versus the, the relatively yeah. easily maneuverable animal with a bunch of spiky armor on it. Yeah, I'm sure, mm -hmm. we'll, I'm sure we'll get to it. I'm pretty sure, I'm guessing you probably have on your slides later, but I'm sure we'll get to it where natural and and are competing against each other too. Yes, yes. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we will talk about that. So uh, this is just another you know, example of evolutionary arms races. Uh, on the top right, Right, you have different groups. You have uh, pigs, um, seals. There's Didacurus with his big tail spike. He's a, an armadillo relative. B, there's a bunch of different rhinos. And then C, down there, you have some different elephants. And then there's like an Arsinoetherium down there in the, the bottom corner. Um, yeah, it's, so yeah, it's funny how it's funny how some animals, you know, throughout the even millions of years apart, they look, they look similar to their not not even ancestor, but they look like the armadillo. It's like almost like a uh, ink. Unkilled. Well, yeah, if, yeah if, exactly that thing. And some of the anchi the notosaurs don't have a tail club. The ankylosaurs do, and so right. you get just the variation on it. But it's performing the same function of in in the uh, uh, armadillos and the extinct forms, where you've got a heavily armored animal that is sluggish, but it has a lethally dangerous tail. That all mm -hmm. it needs to do is to hit you anywhere and. It could maybe kill you, but it'll certainly hurt, and you'll never do that again. And <laughs> right, like rhinos and triceratops. <laughs> right, exactly. And so this is the final uh, example. So here, a lot of these are probably more for sexual selection rather than strictly for defense. Uh, we have the uh, the synthetosaurids over the top right. So there's a group of of artiodactyls that are all now extinct, but they have a wide variety Be like, of different. Which way do which way do one horse face? This way, that way, that way, this way, this is way. Can you imagine yeah, exactly. the one on the upper right hand corner trying to go through a forest of closely packed trees? No. Yeah, I I would imagine that was. I, I wonder if that was a, a a forest dweller. I'd have to go back to, or sorry, a a, a field dweller. Yeah. Exactly. But I have to go back in the original and, paper and see which what what taxa that is. What taxa? Yeah, that in, in fact that there would be if you think about how an environment goes. You aren't going to have critters with ridiculously large uh, a headgear like that in a closely packed forest. It won't work unless they're incredibly right. small animals that can scamper along. You know, only about yay big. Oh, isn't that cute little thing with the antlers? Which insects can get away with? And so now you have a bit right. of scaling, and you have your environment that adds yet another dimension to this multi-dimensional factor that's acting as selection, but we try to kind of cartoonize it yes. as natural selection and, and sexual selection, but there's just oodles of stuff all going on simultaneously. Yeah, so, so like, so when we were still little hiding from the dinosaurs back in the pre traces, we probably weren't having all this nice little, probably weren't having all this big antler no. stuff. Everything was just a shrew, basically. <laughs> Everything was just a little shrew. <laughs> Uh, or a badger or something like that. They were they were all very small. Um, you know, they, nothing nothing had really big sexual ornamentation. Um, group B there on the left, those are all giraffids. Uh, group C, those are pronghorns. So those are giraffoids rather than giraffids. And then group uh, then the the picture on the right, those are just all all cervids. Those are all deer. Just a huge variety of different yeah. uh, antler types. I mean, good lord. Look and at some that. of them you look at and go, holy moly, what? Now, if, if something like this was intentionally designed, you're going, whoa, they've got issues. What's, 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 I mean, maybe. Of, what's one of these pictures is Bambi's skull? <laughs> I actually, I just by looking at them, I have, I have no idea because the, the paper mixes extent and extinct um, yeah. species, so I have no idea which of those, if any, I think is they're like all, a modern deer. I think they're the extreme cases, so the, the, the deer, little Bambi's, 
are relatively bland. They're 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 yeah. below the radar as as just your basic forms. And then all you have to do is imagine the fact that you've got a critter that has horns of some sort. Various specialized versions of those in specialized lineages can go hog wild because you've got a little gene that causes that to go there and that to duplicate there and blah, 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 fractally in much the same way that we get with feather structure and other things that are fractal or tree limbs and, and um, fronds right. that you get in the plant environment. And that's why they can go in so many complicated directions. But then the moment you're getting on those roads of over-specialization, now you're skating on a thinner ice in terms of long-term survivability in the same way that saber-toothed cats pop up over and over and over again as highly specialized predators, if different lineages of uh, mm -hmm. the saber-toothed form. And pretty much when any mass extinction comes along and their prey goes extinct, so do they. And which right. of the, also, right. what's, the, what's of these antlers is the best for flying for Santa's reindeers? Oh, oh, <laughs> yes, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm well, honestly not entirely sure. You'll have to you'll have to take that up with the big man himself. For, yes, for yes. I, I don't think a proper monograph has been done on the aerodynamics of flying reindeer. So this is a potential study here. Hear that, SFT? I, go, go, go for it. I would imagine probably not like the second top one. That one looks very non-aerodynamic. Yeah. <laughs> looks like it would create a lot of lot of drag. And see that that brings up the whole point. Antlers and stuff are are heavy and yeah. they're awkward. And so the idea of uh, the, the people have speculated about the, about the sexual environment and the kinds of what, did they engage in just posturing and preening or did they actually engage in, in hitting one another? And that goes into a completely different dynamic. There are, there are technical papers that ponder the extent to which particular, for animals that do actually engage in physical contact, how often they're not necessarily to the death but they're mm -hmm. to who gets exhausted first. Right. Exactly. Because like, um, so, the fighting might break off a thing and then either oh, it doesn't happen. And then you're nothing. humiliated. And, yeah, yeah, and or, or, you have right. to and, off and... and, and, yeah, and, and so, like, like say either nothing happens or that that a half of an antler could be... Could, could not have you be able to fight. Yeah, the I think in, in some of the most virulent of physical combat can actually be deadly will occur mm -hmm. in ones that that are uh, like the walruses and and some of those that you can get into mm -hmm. just an astonishing and then there are some fights to the death among some of the insects and yeah, so why right. that's not more common why it's a specialization has to do with figuring out what all those little dynamics are uh in in the species in its environment and it's an area that's still up in the air in terms of modeling that's a, that's a, a complicated phenomenon it also could probably might determine if if the species are are more harems like walruses and yeah that's one, another variable or, or uh, like a, like a, like a moose like I say a moose does something like, fails he, he's like oh I was go that female over there but walrus if he fails he he not, he's not and and all. remember you've got Basically, cheating yeah. you have opportunities right. for cheating for example you the one where you have a, effectively a harem where there's a single male breeder. But the women can occasionally wander off and boink with one of the little other ones off in the corner, but they want to make sure nobody sees them. And so it gets into some very complicated dynamics in there. Get your red and tooth and claw. Indeed. And it, yep. And so uh, here, so of course, uh, one of the classes that I TA is a botany lab. And so I thought, well, this wouldn't be complete without a discussion of plants. Uh, yeah. Also, because plants are just as much a part of the world of natural selection as animals are and but we tend not to think about them because they're plants what are they doing you know they're just kind of sitting around being plants but in fact they have to compete with each other for pollinators uh, flowers have to do this not not all plants of course because not all of them um, produce pollen but uh but the pollinators the different flowers do have to compete to attract insects that's what happened here on the, uh, with these two so we have the bee orchid. They are both of these are actually two different types of orchids, but they're they're attracting insects in different ways. The bee orchid looks like a bee. So the orchids of this type, which or of this group, which I would guess are not super volatile, are not super. You know, they don't have a really nice smelling um, uh, flowers. So they're operating more by sight rather than by smell. I would assume. I actually I don't know offhand. That's what I would assume here. And so they, the ones who look more like bees, like the animal that's supposed to pollinate them, are the ones who attract 
the pollinators. Whereas on the other hand, we are operating definitely more by smell rather than by sight because these are called these are sexually deceptive orchids. So they smell yeah. like females. They don't look like the females, but they're they cheating. smell like them. Yeah, they're cheating and they're getting the wasp to accidentally pollinate them and carry off their pollen. If, 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 if you think of sex as advertising, mammals and, and vertebrates in general occasionally get into some really elaborate ads but it's rank amateur compared to what the plants do. Like, I, yeah. I wonder. I wonder when plants are gonna gonna do that for the human human species, like attract a female or a male, like to try to pollinate with the humans. Uh well, they'd have to have very very large flowers, and I I don't think humans yeah. are super effective as at like natural pollination. So you know, we're not just running around in the field pollinating <laughs> flowers left and right. So they don't. Yeah, really care yeah. About us. It, the, the the part of our behavior not is. Well, for one thing, because we don't eat the stuff they get, so right. you know that you that uh, you have they produce nectar. Basically, they're sending out a flyer, a pheromonic okay. flyer, saying "yummy yeah. stuff, come and get it, free, that, free." That, that, that'd be a very deceptive orchid. It'd look like a, a like a human meeting object. Yeah, that'd yes, be kind of yes, yeah, creepy. Yeah, <laughs> when you find a plant that, that generates a a, a, pe a flower that looks like human sexual organs. Um, yeah, we it's the end of the world, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got, we got bigger problems to worry about at that point, so yeah, um, yeah. So, anyways, so that's the concept of arms races, they occur between you know, both among and um, between populations and between different species, and they drive all sorts of really neat adaptations. So, at this point, we have looked at and this is, it's not just natural selection, it's also sexual selection. So we're looking at both of these um, together and what is driving adaptation. So now let's take this concept of the arms race and let's apply it not to single, single particular species, but let's apply it across space. And that brings us to biogeography, which is how or, or where organisms live. So we've been looking at the how they live. Now we're looking at the where they live and how these two correlate. So we're talking about yet another orchid. Orchids are a really cool group of flowers. What can I say? Uh, this orchid is called Ceterium halakii. And this orchid is pollinated by different pollinators depending on where it lives. So it, it's here we have, it's in South Africa. And in the southern end of this mountain range with, that it's in, uh, it's pollinated by bees. Well, bees have very short tongues compared to hawk moths. Hawk moths have very, very long tongues. The depth of the flower correlates with who pollinates it. So the very short flowers for the bees are at the southern end, and the flowers get progressively deeper as you go north, uh, and you're pollinated by hawk moths. And actually, in the middle, in the middle area, you have intermediate length flowers <laughs> because you get pollination by both. And so, um, so yeah, it's not just natural selection; it's selection across a particular area now, you can actually how see weird the whole that radius. is if you attribute it to a designer yeah it's it'd be really weird to think of like god is like okay i really like these short flowers over here intermediate flowers over here so and let's long make flowers that over bug here. with a short tongue and then i'm going to make sure that there's stuff in the intermediate where there's a transitional even though there aren't supposed to be any uh <laughs> the examples like this are what really drove Darwin because he looked at the finches and he looked at uh, the Wara and the Falkland Islands. Yeah. So of course the finches and the Galapagos, the Wara and the Falkland Islands. And that orchid um, he literally predicted there would have to yeah. be a pollinator for. Yeah. Yes. Why, why does, yeah, that question, why does that God like wasp, orchid, interspecies action porno? Exactly. Yeah, there you why go. does he like that at all? Um, and, but, and and uh, and uh, and dike hyenas and uh, right. gender shifting fish. I mean, you know, wow. Everyone has, lizards, everyone, yeah. everyone, ha everyone has their everyone has their fetishes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, gods span all the fetishes apparently. And and <laughs> if you look at, at the creationist literature on these topics, good luck because they won't think about them. No. Yeah, no. Yeah, why is it that these organisms adapt in these particular ways? Why do why do moths and bees, why do they visit flowers at all? Yeah. What's like, the point of that? It, it's intriguing that uh, for a little bit of history, 
that there was a big divide between Darwin and Wallace on sexual selection. Mm -hmm. And Darwin was much more of a think it through in all ways point. And uh, also on the issue of artificial versus natural selection. And if anything, Wallace's blind spot was that he saw everything as only natural selection. He didn't right. like thinking that natural selection was just a variant on artificial selection or vice versa. And he didn't like the idea of sexual selection. He thought that all of that was submerged in just a general natural selection thing. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, uh, all the way down really until the 60s and 70s, sexual selection got pushed to the side uh, possibly because it's involving sex, yeah. but eventually, you know, the times change and it's probably no coincidence that in a time of, of opening up sexual issues about women's liberation and changing dynamics, that it mm -hmm. became a topic again. And now it's a, a major factor and it's hard to find there's whole journals about the thing. And so the issue is they now can work out how, whether something has more of a sexual component or has a non-sexual natural selection component and to what extent the two are interacting. Boy, now it's hot topics. Right, and in fact, we will cover that in depth uh, shortly. Uh, it was, right it was Lane. Well, we just did B Orchid's kinky action. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah. and, and wasn't there like a, I think I said before, wasn't there like a, some kind of flower that had a very big stem, whatever, and Darwin, you, Looking for a, yeah, a moth that was or the or have, yeah. Have so a, that was uh, long before they actually yeah. found the bug that, that pollinated That was it. um Angraicum sesquipedale, which was a Madagascan orchid. Because Darwin, I hate how you can remember all these names, Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> well, the um <laughs> the 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 uh I can't remember the hawk mod's name, but um Angraicum sesquipedale. But the uh, so basically, orchid rearing was very popular and breeding was very popular in England at the time Darwin was writing. Hence why mm -hmm. he wrote a whole book about um, the interactions between orchids and insects. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so much like the cool thing about Darwin is he was a man of basically everything. He Insatiably did, curious and yeah, experimental. He in, in, in an insanely large number of experiments. Uh, mm -hmm. He did experiments with how much or how much dirt earthworms could move. Yeah. And then he it's wrote no a book on that. It's no coincidence that some of the earliest people to flip to evolution were plant botanists. And yeah. Asa Gray being a very prominent one, he was very religious. I just came across the quote you'll love uh, where Asa Gray was uh, annoyed with Richard Owen's uh, archetype uh, mm -hmm. notions and the uh, uh, evolution without Darwinism. And he said, it's like trying to do Hamlet while leaving the character of Hamlet out. <laughs> yeah, a little bit difficult. Yeah. <laughs> um. What's um. Oh crap. Uh. The there's the isn't there? There's a play about the two guys who like try to take Hamlet off, and then they're it's like they're dead. Oh, oh, oh Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Rosencrantz and, and Guildenstern where, are dead. Where, yeah. Where it's all the backstage stuff where none of the actual play is taking place, it's all off stage, and you're right. only seeing these two slumpy characters that get bumped off during the course of the play. It's kind of a Tom Stoppard or something, I can't remember, it was the, it was the guy who made the written it. And uh, it's it's a funky little thing. Kind it, of like it, play, it, it played a little bit of a role in my, in my fiction writing uh, because of the idea of the thing that's going on behind the scenes or in the corner of a story while the same story happens. That right. concept. Kind of like a spinoff or something. Mm -hmm. Well, sort of, it's not yeah. that, that so much. It, it's a like what what happens if you look in the door behind what something's happening in a story, right. uh, and you can right. find all sorts of examples of that. Is what, what what's going on in the background, and Hamlet being such a, a fantastically powerful play because the whole point is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern show up very briefly. They're set mm -hmm. off and basically killed uh, uh, um, because of a, a misrepresentation, or they got a, a thing that have somebody killed. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're flunkies. Well, I thought, you know, they must have a life. They have, right. and, and their whole purpose is to just be bumped off in this play. What was going on before that? that that's the premise of it. Anyway, I digress. Right. So it's, yeah, it, everybody, if you haven't, read Hamlet. And uh, also, Rose Krantz and Gillenstern are dead. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah we, we don't want to devolve into a whole conversation about um, <laughs> these sorts of things, because we will. Uh, yeah, indeed. And I still got to do my Roman Empire uh, story on, on Evolution Hour to please uh, a Duke, <laughs> Scott. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so natural selection across space. So uh, here are, here's another example. Here's another major example 
uh, about geography. Now, and as as you mentioned earlier, Lamont, we have the uh, marsupials in South America. Now, researchers knew from the fossils, and well, their their modern distribution is that pretty much all marsupials, with the exception of the Virginia possum, are in either basically South America as well as Central America and Australia. So the question was, if they're there today, and we knew the continents, or we know the continents were together at one point, which way did they go to get to Australia? And so as it, as it kept kind of turning out, well, we're not really finding any marsupial fossils in Africa, so they probably took Antarctica. And in fact, microbiothairs were found in Antarctica, dating to the Eocene. So that's a prediction of evolution. So where in that in that where in that uh, journey did they take a take a take a pit stop over in Mount Ararat? <laughs> uh, Never. None of, none of them did it. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody did it. Um, and, and I'm going to give a, a, a call out, a shout out to our opossums that when the Isthmus of Panama was formed and the great faunal interchange occurred between North and South America and all of these voracious jaguars and predators came in and drove the Dinocaris killer birds extinct, the little lowly opossum <laughs> just does its little thing and spreads right. and spreads and spreads all the way into the Northern <laughs> Hemisphere, all over the place, you know, no one's yeah. bothering me. We're just doing things yeah. well. And it is a spectacular success story. Yeah, that, that gotta be a thing. The only the, the only uh, uh, marsupial that 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 survived on a landed was this, just marsupials. Yeah, and and we have yeah. to add another variable here when we're dealing with critters as small as what we're talking about with the very basal uh, marsupials and rats and various other groups. They're so small they can hitch a ride on rafts. Vegetation yes. that just flacks off in the middle of a hurricane and swoops across, and you're gonna have a whole bloody family. A breeding population that just waltzes across most of them will die and so that doesn't happen all that often but it only has to happen once in a while and mm -hmm. it lands on an island and bingo away they go and so bingo, uh, that bingo. that biogeographical transition of things uh has to be entered into the mix which can't happen if you're looking at something the size of a gompa fear and the and the big yeah. critters down there uh that but, can't do that trick but I wonder how many fossils are in, in, in Antarctica right now that we can, can, don't have access to. Uh, oh, the, I actually oh. met a uh, – so I met once a paleontologist uh, who does her research in Antarctica, or at least did. I don't know if she still does it. Uh, her name is Dr. Julia Clark, and so she uh, is, has named a number of species such as yeah. Vegavis, which was a, yeah. a, a – There's Mesozoic basically just a few spots – along some of the peninsulas where uh, they, it gets available where they're not covered with ice and the yes. paleontologists do whatever they can. Yeah. You're basically all along the coast where it's not yeah, under meters yeah. of ice. Because <laughs> I, I remember the, the same thing happened when, uh, what's his name, Fa found Tiktaalik, the idea, like a one month window. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like a one month window to get, get in there. Get and to, and get out. Uh, polar bears Correct. and predators and stuff. And, and it's cold, bleak environment. I mean, this is why uh, paleontologists are not dilettantes, that they really <laughs> love their work because they will tolerate conditions from broiling deserts to dangerous mountains where terrorists are shooting at you to right. animals potentially attacking you. Uh, uh, if you try to do their thing, but they're going to do it because they got to look to the spots where by geographically the animals would have existed. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, the other, there's just a little sidebar here about the concept of convergent evolution. So, um, these guys on the left are called noto ungulates. They're part of a group, which it, it turns out actually, um, uh, was it Toxodon and Macrachenia? Um, there were some proteins recovered from both of them, which got sequenced. And so it turns out the closest relatives of the noto ungulates are actually the odd hoofed mammals. So the rhinos, horses, and tapers, very interestingly. Um, but these guys underwent similar selective pressures in South America and actually hit on a whole bunch of similar um, niches. So actually there were yeah. elephant-like uh, noto ungulates, there were hippo-like noto ungulates, Horse-like ones, rabbit-like ones, even a hyrax-like ones. They this these similar selective pressures honed these organisms uh, yeah. into similar. I'm morphologies. trying to think of the word for it. I'm not sure if it's echomorph, but that there are certain kinds of shapes that fit in certain kind of niches. 
and mm-hmm. varying animal forms can evolve into them. If you think of, of, of like and this, uh, one of the drivers of these things are mass extinction events, where mm-hmm. it clears the deck of a whole bunch of niches, fillers, and then the new critters come about by natural selection, and it takes a long time to do. So you have often millions of years before this happens, but essentially the ecological bathtub refills. But right. the different players filling similar roles. Or you can have ones where because of isolation, um, Madagascar is a spectacular example of a whole bunch of little shrew-like animals and mole-like animals and other kinds of things, but they're not mm-hmm. shrews or moles. They're filling the same niches, but they're all marsupial. Or all, all lemuroids, I think. That, that, that's, uh, uh, or afrothairs. Afrothairs, there we go. Yeah. So, yeah, and uh, so are we good on that slide? We're good yeah. on the... Yep. Okay, yep. so... So, Wallace says line. Wallace yep. says line. So we have again another example. Uh, so more biogeography. So natural selection was kind of the the gateway drug to biogeography, <laughs> and so yeah. now here we are co- talking about all sorts of different biogeographic patterns. Uh, one of the most famous ones. This one dates all the way back to the, the mid eighteen hundreds with Alfred Russell Wallace. Is Wallace's line? So he studied this area very intensely. Um, on the, you basically have. Um, two sides of Wallace's line. So you have the the sort of Asia side where you have the Laurasia therian fauna and the Yorkonta fauna. Yeah. So basically, you have monkeys, elephants, tigers, deer, all the birds, animals, in- birds and plants, the whole nine yards. It was yep. just he's going whoa. The, the they're so different on the on in relatively close similar environments. They're similar latitudes, similar temperatures. Yes. Why are there so many differences between those two sides? Right. Exactly. And so yeah, he. And so on the Australia side, so just just a, a little hop across these these very small uh, seas, a, a pretty short hop across to the, the next island, you have completely different fauna, yeah. radically different. Yeah. Unlike in, say, the Galapagos, where the finches of the Galapagos are very closely related to the finches of Ecuador. Yeah. This is totally the opposite. They are completely different faunas. Um, and so you have kangaroos and, uh, and uh, uh, platypuses. On one side, whereas you have monkeys and elephants on the other, totally different. It's 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 like it's the only except for the except for the possibly in North North America, like like these uh, marsupials could only survive without competing with the placentals. Basically, yeah, and, and as we've introduced all sorts of things like uh, dogs and cats and foxes and pigs and bears into Australia, it has destroyed numerous yeah. species. <laughs> yeah, because so, there, is, there is a, a cost-benefit ratio, an advantage to being a placental form in many contexts, uh, as opposed to being a marsupial one. And overall, placentals have been more competitive than marsupials. They, they, they have a variety of specialized niches that they go into. And the glaring example, of course, is that the one and only set of uh, uh, egg-laying monotremes are in Australia, the echidnas mm-hmm. and the uh, platypus. You're right, exactly. And, and interestingly, it turns out, and if uh, if anyone who wasn't there at our last talk, we discussed platypuses and, and echidnas because echidnas are an example of a secondary aquatic specialization who then underwent a tertiary terrestrial specialization. Yeah. So yeah. very cool. Well, Oh and yeah, it can the be, water, the land, back to water, back to land again. It can yep. be argued that if you have certain heavily specialized characteristics, that you can get your niche down and you hunker down and operate very successfully. All it has to do is avoid being eaten. And remember, right. uh, uh, there were relatively few higher level predators in Australia until the introduction of uh, uh, conventional mammals. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, the other group, and so we have the Afrothairs, which evolved in Africa and then spread to, um, Asia and Europe and North America later. So you have elephants, uh, elephant shrews, uh, aardvarks, and then RJ mentioned the, uh, the, the Tenrec, which is yeah. uh, native to Madagascar. So it looks like a hedgehog, but is not anywhere closely related to a hedgehog, uh, hyraxes and manatees. So, yep, these are all, uh, these guys evolved in Africa, filled a whole bunch of niches. And these niches were convergently filled by other groups in on other continents. Yeah, I think we mentioned this also uh, again in our water episode where the the manatee and the elephant different mm-hmm. selection pressures. One like land plants, one like water plants. They're like different direct. 
Yes. Yeah. Yep. The, the manatees preferred saltwater plants, whereas elephants preferred freshwater plants, and this pushed them in totally opposite Different directions. directions. Yeah. Again, uh, tiny little pressure. differences like that, and that, and and uh, the reason why everything is kicked into high gear within your lifetime, uh, uh, Lamont, is because now we have increasingly the genetic information to know what genetics are responsible for particular traits, and because. Even though the selection is acting on individuals within a population, all of that ultimately is due to what mutations are taking place and at what level. And yeah. until you know what those are, you can't deal with the measurements of it. I also think it's cool, off topic, kind of off topic, but not. I don't think it's cool that, except for maybe a slight, maybe few tidbits here and there, that most of our genetic information already masked our morpho morphological information we already had. Except for, yeah, there's, evolution doesn't have astonishing variation on things. And it's, it's a revealing notion that the surface characteristics that the morphologists were paying attention to, the antlers and the skin colors and the mm -hmm. hair and all the stuff, it's a visible thing. Understandably, this is what they would have been dealing with. Unless you were a really weird person, like you're know, Leonardo da Vinci types that would do autopsies and stuff. Just now, apparently, there's been a brand new thing where they've, they've got more information on the kidna penises, which it turns out do not look like what you normally think a penis ought to look like. Oh, with the, the three yeah. heads? It's or like whatever. weird. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, okay. <laughs> again, yeah, they're, I, they're really yeah, again, I think we I think we mentioned this before, but I think like one of the major things they thought was different after genetics was the, the bat thing. Some they thought some bats were more primate like, then they found out they weren't. Yes. Uh, they genetics. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That yeah. all happened. So any anybody that wants to, to play authority quote game from c c uh, evolutionary science literature before 1995 on, on organisms had better be wary because they're pre homeo box, pre genetic revolution. And so the farther back that they're trawling for material, the more likely it is that they're misrepresenting it because they couldn't know the answers to a lot of the questions that we've resolved now because they didn't have most of the data available. And I right. see here we got a speciation event when the Pamela, the Pamela canal got on un oh, the, the Isthmus of Panama. Yeah, yeah, yeah built, exactly. got built, momentous the, effects no on more, climate. No more, no more breeding. <laughs> right, it, exactly. It, yeah. Uh, the, the fish example there is the most obvious one, and they can trace that in great detail. And there's others, you know, clams and all these other things as and now they're them, yeah. now separated on that landmass. But not only that, it, it also allowed the north-south faunal interchange, which is cleverly called the Great Faunal Interchange. It's got a, a, all capital <laughs> letters stuff. But not only that, it changed global weather patterns and is part of the reason why the savannas were forming in Africa, which had a selection pressure on the origins and, and the derivation of what happened with the hominids all connects yeah. together man it does it does all connect together uh so yeah that's the, the pork fish example explain that rather well yep uh whereas on the right here we have so these are laurasia thayers um this really neat picture shows the it connects the phylogeny with the biogeography which i wish um, actually, uh, some research I was doing recently for a certain paper uh, yeah. for school connected a lot of biogeography with phylogeny. So as you can see, on the uh, at the more basally derived branches are in are all in yellow. So all the Laurasia theres are all the their orders. Sorry, all the orders originated in North America. You have Eulipatiflans, which are the the shrews, moles, hedgehogs, those guys. And then you have uh, set artiodactyls, so the even hoof mammals, perissodactyls are the odd hoof mammals, uh, carnivorans, the dogs and cats, and pholodotas, the pangolins. So they all, all their orders originated in North America, as well as bats. And then from there, the bats spread. So the first, uh, the earliest bat is uh, uh, Icarinicterus in this study. I don't, yeah, they didn't include Onicarinicterus. And then the slightly later bats show up in Europe, so they cross the Bering Strait bridge yeah. into and that, Eurasia. And that, uh, yeah, Never another from there. Yeah, another uh, what you said exchange. Not only the still the South America exchange, the Asia North America exchange for the Bering yeah, Strait. And it, it's still unclear the extent to which some uh, primates may have come across uh, that Asian route. Yeah, Ooh, we took. Uh, yeah, Erica, t me and Erica talked about that on our pri uh, on our primate migration episode, where we uh, talked about how, how the primate morphs from North America. 
and they yeah. went over to uh, Africa to become the primates. Biogeography is the the garlic and crucifixes to the creationist vampire. <laughs> that it's it's a concept that they can never deal it with. And all you need to do is to look through creationist articles at AIG and ICR or the Baromenology papers and ask yourself, where and when do you claim these things live? And it's just not on their scope. Nope. Even though theoretically not. there should be a model about things spreading out from Ararat and speciation events taking place, this and that, blah, blah, blah. There's an implied biogeographical model but mm -hmm. they're never going to be able to put it up because it's going to be ridiculous. Yeah, no, they, they have worked out zero of it. And in fact, RJ and I do plug for our book and discuss in the rocks were there a couple of the upper echelon, and I say that in quotes, biogeographic models they put forth for some flood things, and they're hilarious. They are astoundingly yeah. silly. Like the, the floating forest hypothesis, which... Earth is wise. not even wrong. <laughs> so it's it's so bad even other creationists have problems with it. Yeah. And and then there's a whole bunch of stuff on bats and their the, the distribution and how they don't deal with that and, and it, uh, fascinating stuff that we discovered in the course of doing the book about the intricate relationships uh where we're talking about that pollinator aspect again. The the, the neat thing was that there's a species of, of cactus that is pollinated by bats. Yeah. And you have to imagine, what, was the bat on board the ark and it took the cactus with it to the Sonora Desert? Uh, good luck on that. But what's intriguing is that there's a distribution as to which bats pollinate. And there's one particular species on this particular cactus. Uh, and it has to hover and get the nectar that way. Fine and dandy. Well, that's energy intensive. It turns out there's another species of bat, an insectivore that's real small, that can land on the cactus, walk its way around spikes, and start pollinating it by stealing the nectar under the nose of the great big flyer bat. It's more energy intensive. So they're starting to take, we're literally seeing the process of a transfer between one bat species to another as the main pollinator for this cactus. Yeah. So this is uh, kind of the final uh, of the natural selection. So now, so, now we're going so to move on. Real, real fast. The, the middle one is the one, the, like we have outgroups, we have the extinct and we have extant. Yeah. So those are, so uh, if I can make it large again, hold on, let me see. So yes. So the, uh, you have onychonycterus and icarinycterus, both of which are from North America. Then those extinct ones, uh, archaeonycterus, hasionycterus, paleocaropteryx are all from Europe. And then you have, and so, you have the earliest bats in North America, then you see the next ones cropping up in Eurasia immediately after, which indicates either they, I mean, theoretically, they could have gone straight from North America to Europe. Uh, the, the continents were closer back then, so that could have happened, or they could have taken the Bering Strait land bridge. Either way, they got to Eurasia next, is so, the point. But, so, and, that's, so we, but we still have, we have, we have some uh, species that could, could bridge our more genetic together but they're extinct so we, we, we're the more distant relatives of the living yeah. creatures yes. it's revealing that exactly. todd wood in his one and only attempt to take a stab at bat baromans uh in 2008 only dealt with two of the 20 bat families <laughs> left out all the genetic information and most of the fossil data oh baromanology yeah. uh, bear another call back to jackson we, we episode on this channel yeah yeah, and and we wrote a chapter, a whole chapter about it in the rocks for there. So, yeah. go so a, go a wonderful book. source of information for everybody that is curious about a lot of shit. Exactly. So, this is our last uh, little segment on natural selection. We're going to bump on over now to our third uh, mode of selection, which is the, the sexual kinky one. selection. The kinky selection. The kinky selection. So, there are basically two brands of sexual selection. And in my humble opinion, the first one is the less interesting one. This is called the law of battle. So mm. it is what it sounds like. Um, males. Yeah. Uh, typically males. Now there's probably female competition, yeah. but I think that's probably less prevalent than male competition. Yeah, I, think, is. I, I yeah. recall that there are such things too, but they're really rare. Yeah. But, and I think yeah. some of them might be occurring in aquatic yeah. organisms. Some fish, and, and, I seem to recall, have some female 
yeah. um, dynamics. That, that we, that, that so, could be. we talked about this earlier too. too. The, the left, the left one is for trying to get the best mate, and the right one trying to get trying to get all the mates. <laughs> yes, yes, and that's another. Yeah, that's that's an interesting dynamic of how um, these interactions are occurring, because as as you said, the deer are not fighting for all the females; they're fighting for one female, whereas the elephant seals uh, are fighting for a whole harem. And because of this, this dynamic, this uh, behavioral dynamic, is also causing morphological changes. Is um, there is a a thing called sexual dimorphism? So it's where males and females look different now. As in terms of humans, males and females look very similar. Um, you know, uh, breasts, things like that, hair length. Yeah. These are very, very similar uh, in overall proportion between males and females. Whereas, which is why men and women can dress up in ways that make you forget which one's which. Ex exactly right. Exactly, and so whereas for deer or elephant seals. When you have um, when you have competition between males for a harem, you're going to have gigantic differences between the sexes. The male elephant seals are, I think, those are females in front in the foreground. Yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah, they are huge they're, compared to the females. You, if you looked at that picture and didn't know better, you'd say, "Oh, there are the children down below." Oh, well, those are the females. Yeah, those are the females that the males are competing for. Whereas in species where you have one male and one female getting together. Uh, you have much reduced sexual yeah. dimorphism. So, so on average, Bambi's not mom and dad are much more like one another yes. than our little frisky seals' mom and dads. Right. Now, th this isn't always the case per se. For instance, uh, anglerfish, the males can only pick one female. And the reason is they actually attach themselves physically to the female. So the male's a parasite on the much larger female. <laughs> And like like with in, and like with spiders and in, some insects, once once they mate, their lunch. Yes. Oh, well, that, for that's some, yeah, uh, somewhere where well, literally the the spider that will devour uh, the mate afterwards, or well, again, Sister Tatiana's uh, uh, sex advice book, that absolutely hilarious, Doctor Tatiana. It, it's it's one of the most hilarious and scientifically accurate uh, uh, explorations of the sex life of critters. And you will never be able to not remember that crap. Because you will, it will, you'll never be able to stick it out. The bees with the detachable penises. I mean, all of the fascinating stuff. <laughs> right, right. So we we good. Law of battle, pretty easy yeah. to grasp. Yeah. Yep, pretty easy. Now, the more interesting one, in my personal opinion, is called female mate choice. This is the second brand of yeah, which selection. is a relatively recent discipline in the field. It, it's it's been a, um, it started out as like not a thing. And then yes. people started paying attention. Like, what you mean you're supposed to pay attention to the, the female making a choice? Well, whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's that's another part of that, uh, you know, sort of female empowerment thing Sexism. where yeah. now we're we're putting emphasis more, we, them, the researchers, are putting more emphasis on what role the females are playing in selecting mates. It's, it's not all just two males slugging it out over a female. It's the female yeah. choosing particular males. And out of a, hey, out of a group. let me look at that boy. Yeah, but, uh, I'll pass on you. But, but you I, know, I, they, they, there's a lot of left sweep swiping. Yeah, in the true, <laughs> true. I, I, I guess that's what the fighting is for. So you're you're the only choice the female has. Like like like, hey, I'm the only one, only one left here. So you got you got to pick me. <laughs> and and remember, yeah, well. Yeah. 19th century Victorian male dominated uh, zoologists were not prone to think much about this. And that's what makes Darwin so out of the ordinary right. in terms of thinking that, that he's going against the grain. He had a family where there were just an astonishing amount of very prominent and intellectual women. And mm -hmm. if you want to find out about that, uh, read Darwin's Sacred Cause, which is more about the slavery issue. But there's oodles in there about uh, the Darwin family and the Wedgwood family and the various strong will women in that area. And so that's probably part of the influence that he would think about these things because he could see it in our little niche human species that the sexual things are more complicated than, than the, the, the textbook was indicating back in 1850. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, Wallace totally objected to female mate choice uh, from, yeah, he was also on board yeah. the, um, the 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 females don't choose. It's just as RJ said earlier. It's 
any uh, feather, you know, bright feathers I have, this is merely showing that I don't have intestinal parasites. Yeah. And in that's that all way, that's doing. the conservative landowner aristocrat Darwin was more liberal than mm -hmm. the left wing socialist uh, uh, spiritualist Wallace. <laughs> Ooh, we probably should hurry with this because I can hear thunder out there, so I might lose Ooh, it. Oh, yeah, to... you've got stormies um, out there in so, Louisiana. So on the right, or sorry, on the left, we have the male great Argus pheasant who is presenting to the female. I didn't want to choose a peacock because everyone knows what a peacock looks like. Not what everyone a knows what a, what what a, a great Argus pheasant looks like. So that's cool, <laughs> I think. Uh, whereas on the left, you have a bunch of blue mannequin males lecking in front of a female. Lecking is a type of dance they do where they like whirl and, and whip in the air and all sorts of cool stuff. And the female uh, picks one and she's like, okay, he's, he's pretty cool. You know, I'll choose him. And so... The, she looks both in both cases, the females, the very drab one, because she's the one doing the selecting. It's the males who have to present to her. I, yeah. I, I, like, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Like, fine, I'll mate with you, whatever. Go on. That is base. That is, I mean, quite literally what's happening here. Yes. And it, it naturally brings to mind the idea that since birds are a branch of dinosaurs, to what extent was dinosaur mating similar to some of the things that we see in derived birds today? Right, exactly. And then that takes us back to the evolutionary arms race thing earlier with uh, the crests on the hadrosaurs and the theropods and, and also the frills oh, on ceratopsians. Yeah. How much of it's, that was, was sexual? Yeah, yeah this is, I, think you, I think you mentioned this in, in one of your later uh, videos recently about, about yes. the guppies that the, the predator ones were more camouflaged, but the non-predator ones were more colorful. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. This, this is exactly. the very thing. Yep, so that was in, uh, also uh, hearkening back to uh, Experimental Evolution Part 1. So yeah, this is one of my favorite experiments. I just think it's really cool that you can test, at, uh, going back to what we were talking about earlier, about, about opposing pressures, opposing selective pressures. So you have, on the one hand, sexual selection. The females like the sexy males with all the pretty yellow spots. Whereas... In the other environment where you have big predatory pikes, um, flashy uh, fish make quick yeah. dinner. Who cares about colors? Let's survive is basically the thought process. And so if you are very colorful, you get eaten. Yeah, you get seen by the, the predator. And so the ones who are camouflaged, they hide, but they're not pretty. So there are these opposing pressures. And I just think that's a really cool experiment that kind of that demonstrates that. So we good so on this. All you one? have to do is yeah. to switch the competitors back and forth into different selective environments and different outcomes. <laughs> and, and it all uh, happens automatically, naturally, not by intention or design. And also, how exactly. far can it they sep do do that separate before the colorful fish can no longer interbreed with the camouflage fish? Aha! Exactly. exactly. That's a really good question, which leads us to our next slide: <laughs> the ring species. Bingo. It's so, almost like he's thought this through. Exactly. So we keep uh, the thing that I, I kind of arrange these are as each step is sort of a gateway drug to the next step. So if you yeah. if you if you buy that, eh, maybe not a good way to phrase it, but if you buy that mutations um, generate novelty, as we literally showed that they do. And if you buy that, you can select for particular uh, particular mutations over others. Well, how far does that go until you get totally different organisms? And how far does that go until they can no longer breed? And so, in fact, we have examples of that in nature. Those are called species complexes. Is that the Anolis lizard? Those are Incitina salamanders. Ah, okay. So these are, are California salamanders. Uh, this is an, an older example, and there's been uh, more recent research, so it's not there, there was a Jerry Coyne posting, which a lot of creationists really jumped on. Oh, the again, ring species thing? Yeah. yeah. And again, it's weird because in principle, there's nothing creationists have to have against ring species. They claim to accept species. Michael Denton freely accepted the over at Intelligent Design Land. Michael Denton freely accepted that uh, oh, uh, ring species implied speciation. Yeah, I mean, heck, he, he says that each that the phyla are created type so he has to but it's like then they don't <laughs> apply that at all so it's who cares you know yeah but it's it's but anyway, meaningless concession right meaningless concessions so uh in the incitina salamander it's not a perfect ring species in the sense that every population is equally viable um you actually do have little segments where you have 
close interbreeding and then segments where you don't have close interbreeding. But by and large, you have two um, arms around this, this desert in the middle of California, and salamanders don't do very well in the desert. So they go around it through the mountains or through the, fo the, the forest on the coast. And so on the one side, on the coastal side, you have unblotched salamanders. But on the, co on the inland side, you have blotched salamanders. And the ones on the blotched side are more closely related to each other than any of them are to the unblotched ones. And once you finally get kind of down here at the bottom, where you have Cawberry and, uh, and Exhultzi, or however you pronounce that, then they cannot interbreed. But Clawberry can interbreed with Crociator, and Exhultzi can interbreed with uh, Xanthoptica. So you have the arms on both sides, but they don't breed across. They can only interbreed oh. with those on their own side. Yeah, in fact, I, I can't think offhand of any creationist really seriously thinking through the implication of what it means for A to interbreed with B, and B with C, and C with D, but A and D won't interbreed. But this is telling you about the zygotic isolation mechanisms relating to speciation, so, they just don't connect those dots. So do we right. do we do we know why the, the, the ones on the other one side are more yellow looking? Is it like for, for camouflage or sex or, or what? Um I don't know if there is a hypothesis on that. I mean there there may be. I, I just don't know. Um okay. it could be that that's just a result of genetic drift. It just happened that one yeah. population developed a, a certain pattern in the forests. And that's just what stuck. And then you're stuck with it. Yeah. Remember, yeah. The, uh, as St. Stephen J. Gould once said, everything ain't adaptive. Right. Yeah, it, it could be. Because if you look at the original, the, the Picta at the very top, um, or I, actually I think it's or it's Oregon. No, I think it's Picta. Uh, if you look at Picta at the very top, yeah. It, yeah, okay. Um, it has spots on the tail. Well, the spots on the tail are lost in the coastal lineage, but the spots kind of cover the entire animal in the inland lineage. So it could just be... Those, it's for those just who a, haven't a, been to, to California coast, it's fairly dry and arid. Uh, up, yeah. up in northern California, it would be like Oregon and Washington that's got a lot of pine trees and stuff on it. Uh, in the southern area and along the coast is the desert. That little central desert thing, of course, is now not desert anymore because it's all done with the irrigation because they stole all the rivers and reallocated the water and <laughs> right. all that kind of stuff. So maybe basically, maybe the spots on the, on the right side were useful. Maybe they weren't, they just they, they stayed. Yeah. It could be it, they were it, useful or it could just be that, you know, that there happened to be a population which increased their number of spots and that's, just and, how it ended and, up. and it's an answerable question in principle as they get farther and farther to know what exactly are the genes and developmental processes mm -hmm. that produce the surface features right right exactly but i would um, suggest that at the moment they don't know enough about the genes but i think we have to remember that out of the zillions of organisms done only a tiny fraction of them have had full genomes done Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and for the on the right side, I, I don't really think about ring species for fishes that much. Yeah. So I, the cichlids. I, yeah, I wouldn't exactly call these a, a. They're really a ring species, but yeah, it's it's they're all um, because they're you can see the little segments, so they're not interbreeding with each other because they each have their own little sections on on uh, Lake Tanganyika. They're all trophyous cichlids, yeah. um, but they have. You can clearly tell they're all very similar. They all have the same body outline shape, right? They all look very, very similar. And in fact, they're all the same genus. They're and they're different species. Or, yeah. That's one bunch. The cichlids have had really a lot of genetic work done on them to where they can identify some of the genes that are actually producing the variations in the, 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 the sticklebacks and the little feel frills and all these other little things precisely because they're such a a natural laboratory of oodles of fish species in a relatively modestly sized lake. Right. And you're right. going, what's going on here? Right. And in fact, we will return to that in uh, shortly. We will come back to the cichlids. So yeah, for this example, I just kind of want to show the species complex, how they're all very similar, just slightly different. And that kind of asks, well, are they related? Hmm. Good question. So we good on this one? Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. Hi, so again, Lisa our, for truth. Hi, Lisa for truth. So, uh, species complexes are our gateway drug to adaptive radiations. Um, <laughs> we're, because we're if, on it now. <laughs> if you accept, if you've, I think everything up to this point is fairly reasonable, right? Like, 
mutations happen. They cause morphological changes. They are selected. None of that is big or new. And so by this, and speciation happens... Like, we have direct observed examples of speciation, and then we just showed some examples with the, the ring species. So, if you've bought everything up to this point, and there's no reason not to, then adaptive radiations are just a consequence of continued speciation events. You just yeah. keep going. Um, and so, for the finches on the Galapagos, you have the finches on different islands specializing on different niches, or on the same island special specializing on different niches. And so they have different beak sizes and uh, widths and different behaviors as they specialize on whether it's seeds or nuts or cactuses or it, blood in the case of GSBs of Septentrion analysis. So um, uh, I, I like the, I like the one the wood the woodpecker fence. Yeah, yeah, they they are um, you know to not compete with each other so that the populations would not compete. They specialize on different foods and then hey. If you don't eat the same thing I do, we don't have to worry about it. There's food for everybody. Um, yeah. And then on the right side, we have the soapberry bugs. This was actually a recent speciation. So soapberry bugs, the original is the one on the top. So their beak length is, is the red. And so you can see it was a lot shorter. And then there was a fruit that was introduced called the balloon vine fruit, which after its introduction, the beak of the, of the, the soapberry bugs increased it got much longer so they could eat this new fruit that is now appearing in their environment, which, which was introduced in their environment. And that looks like that's, uh, I see Key Largo, so that must be Lake, uh, Lake something or other. That's uh, uh, Florida. That's Florida, yes. That, yeah, that's okay. Florida. So this adaptive radiation was under was, was occurring in in uh, Those Florida. little bugs are currently some of the most intelligent organisms in Florida. <laughs> yeah, yeah, although you know that's not very that's not a very high bar to cross. So. And since we're on the fences, <laughs> where is that famous big bird finch come in here? Oh yeah, uh, that, well, that lives on the that? island of PBS. Ha ha ha! <laughs> so the big bird finch was a hybrid between two species. These are all monophyletic lineages. Yeah. Big bird was a was a, a hybrid. So there was a, if I remember correctly, and I could be getting this wrong, but if I remember correctly, there was a famine or a drought or something like mm. that and so a male and a female of two different species mated and produced um a couple of babies and then they mated and had babies and so you have this very genetically homogenous population of this little hybrid which is big bird yeah. and so and the, the, uh, yeah. it's i'm certain it's one of the papers done by one of the grants uh, one of the, one of the i think it grants. is uh, yeah. rosemary and peter are the great experts in this area and they turn out about one paper a year where they alternate which one is the is the lead author so sometimes it's rosemary grant and the other times it's peter can i take a stab at uh, why does aig quote be he when be he is id and aig is yec sure yeah simple answer he's the best they've got he's the port of yeah. the storm they're they're forced into it because frankly there's nobody that has kind of the cachet of credibility as lowly as it is as michael be Right. And so they latch on to him. Uh, typically, when he is cited, they'll put a little footnote. Bear in mind that he doesn't accept the true geology and things that we've worked out. But, you know, maybe we'll get him persuaded one of these days. They do that kind of a thing. But, yeah, they have to do that. Yeah. In the same way that for a long time, um, the intelligent design movement had to try to trawl Kurt Wise as their paleontologist, which was a dangerous thing to do since he's a young earth creationist. And so once they found Gunter Beckley, uh, a nice, normal, intelligent designer, in quotation marks, um, then they don't have to bother about that anymore. So it's it's pure opportunism. Right. You're exactly. welcome, Lisa. <laughs> there you go. There you go. They have it. Um, oh, Kenny Hornrickson, our, our resident creationist. There's no such thing as a fossil record. I think that's about like saying there's no such thing as a Kenny Hornrickson. Okay, yeah, we're, we're just going to ignore that. So yeah. on to our final slide here. We have uh, the adapt. We have uh, the final uh, example of an adaptive radiation. To go back to our cichlids, because they are my favorite example. I have cichlids. I love them. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so, again, if you accept speciation and there's no reason not to at this point, then just continue it. In the case of the cichlids, though, especially the ones in Lake Victoria. They have undergone an absolutely immense amount of speciation in just 
a few yeah. hundred thousand years. And part of the reason is the lake keeps drying up to basically a bunch of smaller lakes. So you have the big lake, which is Lake Victoria. Then it dries up, produces a bunch of little lakes. Then you have inbreeding between those lakes and, and genetic bottlenecking. And then the lake refills over the course of a few thousand years. Yeah. And then you have uh, another adaptive radiation. Then you have shrink and then refill adaptive yeah. radiation, it, shrink, it, refill. It's the start of natural ex experimental lab conditions you could do if you had a really big laboratory. And yes. nature's doing it for us. Yep. And the cool thing about it is is so all the the cichlids of lake victoria we know genetically came from lake kivu which is much smaller but much older and the cool thing about it is there are more genera of there are more genera of cichlids in lake kivu even though it's way smaller than lake victoria is than in lake victoria even though there are way more species because there are older genetic divergences between the populations in kivu than in victoria if you look in the picture on the left, the super flock, those are all the cichlids from Victoria. And you see lots and lots of really, really short branches. Yeah. Lots of short branches. So lots of little speciation events, not a lot of deep uh, genera events. Now, so imagine, genera. <laughs> imagine that kind of a dynamic relationship where only a tiny handful of the examples ever got fossilized. Right. And yeah. you could imagine that there is an enormous amount of range of variation and speed of things that are functionally invisible in the fossil record because we just don't have a detailed enough snapshot as we do with the living organisms that we can see in those lakes. Right. Exactly. Well, a, a question about the lake in other words. Were they, they come there when the, the lakes were connected somehow, or were they transported by humans to that yes. lake? No, it, this was this was hundreds of thousands of years ago. So they're moving via the river systems, which, um, like, similar to the lakes, they dry up and and refill, and then the river systems may connect two of the lakes, and then they dry up again, so they're isolated. And I think it's if not in, at least it's next door to a tectonically active area. So the the whole real estate is being pushed up and pulled apart and rearranged. Yes. So connections are being made because the, 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 the Great Rift Valley, that whole area, there are plates that are pushing apart just as California is moving northwards and, and Los Angeles will eventually be a suburb of Portland. Right. And so you have this geologically active region, which is producing a lot of biologically interesting phenomena. Yeah. And so that's so. We have basically covered the whole swath of how evolution works on a very basic level. I'm going to stop sharing. So Everything... basically, this is, this, is, this is middle school or high school level? <laughs> well, or, I would say this is more college level because yeah, yeah. a high school, my experience in high school, I don't know how it is for everybody else, but my experience in high school, while I got the basics of evolution, that's really all we got. We got the basics. We got mutation, natural selection, speciation. Yeah. And then some geologic and, history, and that's about and it. And just remember the dates on most of those papers are within this century. So yeah. they're relatively recent. And I can guarantee you that the kind of big picture we've just gotten here this evening would have been impossible to do when I was your age. Well, and possibly uh, same thing with me and Jackson. The, the, the stuff that I learned in the 80s and 90s are totally outdated for Jackson's <laughs> career. Oh, yeah. There, I, I am yeah. in many respects happy. <laughs> But I didn't take biology in high school. I took chemistry and physics. So I didn't have to unlearn all of the inadequate biology that I might have gotten in the textbooks that were done based on material. If we're talking like 1970 high school textbooks, that would have been stuff that was 1950s, 50s, textbook yeah. version yeah. of uh -huh. 1940s biology. Yeah. And so it, it, they would have known just basically they were new. Uh, uh, DNA was now worked out a little, and they knew that it was mm -hmm. the mechanism of inheritance. Mm -hmm. But think of all of the stuff. The thing that, that was the big gear shift for me was in the 1990s when homeobox genes began to be discovered. And that yeah. means that I literally put a mental break pre-1995 yeah. biology, post-1995 biology. And so it, 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 Jackson's coming up in this area where his yeah. entire educational world has been, and you have as well, 
is, mm -hmm. is in that post-1995 world. So you have a tremendous advantage to leg up on old parts like me that yeah, have like, to disconnect. Yeah, but, like, well, like me, also, like, me and RG had to learn about Pluto being a planet, but Jackson Biden had to learn about Pluto being a planet. <laughs> I, well, I don't I know I anything say, about astronomy. So. And, uh, well, this is why I get all, it, Tempest in the teapot on stupid Pluto. What you call it doesn't matter. If we want to call it a bark maggot, I don't care. Nothing about Pluto has changed. It's yeah. still the same little rock. It's orbiting at the distance, and it's got a couple little moonlets, and it's really right. cold, and yeah. there's no Starbucks there. None of that has changed yeah. based on what you label it. Right. So, um, so basically, yes, this would be sort of a uh, like a, I would say an undergrad uh, intro to evolution. Yeah. Basically, if you were if you were trying to get basically just a sort of very broad strokes basis of how evolution works and some of the right. technical literature that's gone into it, okay. then that's what you, you would have just gotten. So that stuff I could, I could show to my eight year old niece. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. heck all of my videos um, okay. are none of my videos. We don't, okay. you know, cursing sure. or we're not yeah. attacking people, things like that. So yeah, all that kind okay. of stuff works. I, I, I meant like, I meant, I meant, I meant, I meant like level wise. <laughs> Well, I, I let me let me be very particular here. I don't think that it's necessary to dumb down complicated science subjects. Yeah. What you want is to cl clearly explain them. But yeah. the idea that uh, there's no reason why you can't have a child get a grip on dinosaurs and plate tectonics and uh, expanding universes. There's terminology that you wouldn't be using because that would need explaining. Yeah, the, the concepts are still there, and and this right. ironically is one of the reasons why religion can be so cloggy because they could have explained these facts in ways that <laughs> right. would be intelligible to people at the time if they knew them, but they didn't, so they couldn't. <laughs> right? Yeah, it would have been so yeah. much easier to just say, yeah, organisms uh, reproduce with inherent variations rather than. Let's have an allegory about how the universe was invented. Like if that, that would have just kind of solved everything. We wouldn't have had problems. So, evolutionary biologist who's also actually there's a, a surprisingly large number of um, oh you did an awful lot of them do you about Dan Stern Cardinal. Oh, I would classify him as an oh, evolutionary well, I mean, biologist. Well, yeah, I mean he is. Are at least are you talking about uh, Dr. Cardinale? Her, uh, there. I mean, I'm the sure only reason of... why more. So more upper level scientists tend not to do those things is because they're too busy doing their work. And yes, so, yeah. So she's talking about oh, Apologia. Yes. That would be yes, the sir. brand new one with Dan Stern Cardinale. Yeah. He's got his own channel, yeah. uh, creation uh, myths. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, subscribe to that. I've, yeah. I've had Dan on my channel at least twice. We talked about e uh, ERVs. We talked about vaccines. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he's, uh, a, and, he's a virologist. And so he's, he's, all he's part about of our growing stuff. network, our arsenal. Of expertise in a variety of different areas, and and uh, I think it's absolutely delightful. And anybody, every other one that we can get it, that has a disciplinary knowledge uh, in these areas just improves our our case for stuff. And there's no reason why in 2021 you can't present the real information. It's not like it's hidden under a rock somewhere. We can all get to it. Yeah, it's uh, th yeah. The the problem isn't. Isn't accessibility the problem? Is is uh, interest in the subject? Yeah, and it's yeah. damned interesting, and that's another reason why uh, I think that Jackson has the same bug that I do and you do, uh, uh, Lamont. Is that the universe is really interesting, yeah. and you want to know all, everything you can about it? Why not? It's it has the advantage of being true. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. So, 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 so my niece, uh, and this is this on Lisa Shell too. Uh, Earlier, earlier today, that that one of my goals on this channel and stuff is to is to help my nieces not grow up in a stupid America, uh, educate them yeah. so they don't grow up in a uh, America that's like yeah. dumb. We have all the tools yeah. available, and it's up to us to use them. And there's no excuse why we can't. If old farts like me can figure out how to do YouTube, anybody can. <laughs> uh, so, so as we wrap up advertising for me. I'm continuing my, besides more podcasts, I'm continuing my adventures with my time traveling microwave game, the game where we time travel through, a mi through, through microwave black holes and stuff. It's really weird and interesting for physics. What about you two? What's going to be the evolution hour on, on your channel, Jackson? Uh, well, I uh, recently started a new series on, um, on, on the book, The Ancestor's Tale. It's right over here. Really neat book. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're talking about 
so it's if you're unfamiliar with it, it's a book which goes backwards through time rather than forwards. And so we're going to be doing a deep dive, a review of each of the chapters. Well, of each of the tales, really, not necessarily all the chapters. But we're going to review each of the tales as we go backwards through time and discuss what is some of the more what are some of the more recent developments that have occurred since this chapter was written. Yeah, I, I've read both. I, 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 so I didn't own them, but at the library, I checked out both versions of the library, the older yeah. and version two, where they, version two had some things changed around. Yes, I read the first version while I was in uh, high school, uh, while I was in, in junior year of high school. And then uh, when I found out that there was a second edition, I was like, heck yes, thank you. And I got that. Um, okay. You will probably see me popping up on a certain channel. I'm not going to say who uh, mm. in the near future. Um not that's not my own and yeah. i mean you'll see me on rj's as per usual but i'll be on somebody else's channel and you'll probably Ooh. see that in the near future so promiscuous yeah and i'll also I'll get around I yeah. about that is the on the audible i have the, i also have the audible version of that on my phone and it's the and it's a but it's a brit so half the stuff the tells are and the, the chapters are cut out it's like 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 they skip from uh monkeys they skip from like older monkeys to straight to primates and then they skip from like a whole bunch of st other chapters too. Like, like okay, we're just gonna, we're just gonna skip through these tales and the, not really matter. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of them are really short. Like the Flounder's Tale is only like a page and a half or something like that because he basically just kind of goes, "Wow, natural selection is cool," and it's like, "Yes, I agree." I think the whole tale tale. creationists who will get the the the, the sequence completely wrong, and they're creationists who said they they believe we've evolved from bacteria to ducks to apes to us. Oh right, yeah. It's like, did er, did you read the book? <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I I think the uh, my, favorite, my favorite thing is is like between the eukaryotes and the archaea, we talked about how those uh the sh the the cells in that inside the termite or something. Oh yes, you're talking about uh oh RJ, you're gonna laugh at me. It's like uh, Mastotermes darwiniensis. Uh, Dude, what you're... Damn. <laughs> so, uh, so that's yeah. the the the, the termite, and it has Mixotrichia paradoxa, which is the ciliate inside its gut, which yeah. digests cellulose for it. Yeah, yeah. The termites yeah. don't eat eat uh, uh, wood. It's the yeah. gut microbes that eat the wood. But but the gut microbe itself isn't but bunch yes. of organelles. It's bacteria together. Yeah. Yes, of. it has spirochetes on it, which are on its which are are, are on it, which are what uh, cause it to to wiggle through the water in a very the, the, real the fluids, sense yeah. all yeah. large animals are habitats yeah. and rely on their little critters that live inside them that are so small that if they thought mm -hmm. about that they're inside of them it would freak them out yeah, yeah. but 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 now uh, uh, which also brings us back to another episode that, that we are all in together in, in the channel the mb sosis ep the mb but so, endosymbiosis. Yeah, where you talked yes. about how those bacteria and stuff on one end are working together there, but in the other one, they just come together with the eukaryotes to make a whole new organelle or whatever. It's the yeah, classic actually, example yeah. of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. There is an interesting hypothesis. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's based on fact. I don't know what the veracity of the hypothesis is, though. Um, Coenoflagellates, certain species will only coag or only um, conjoin in the presence of certain bacteria. What and the coenoflagellates are our closest protistan relatives. So, what are the odds that mm. this happened in the ancestors of sponges, which caused multicellularity in animals? Entirely and possible. And a slew of genes that are known from more complex organisms are known in yes. coenoflagellates. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. The um, yeah. the uh, that was like just P52 coming on the scene. That, that was just coming on the scene, really, in the 1990s, and since then. And mm -hmm. other than some scatter shot pot shots by Casey Luskin and a few things, it doesn't get covered much yeah. in the anti-evolution literature. Yeah, is, is that no. why? Like, like some some people like I was uh, not. The not sure if sponges are animal, uh, true animals, or they're on the other side of the animal divide. Since well, that was kind of a uh, that was kind of a question. Um, I think it's more like there are some coenoflagellates who it's like, are they animals? There's uh, Proterra spongia, for instance, which looks almost like a sponge. Uh, but the sponges, the question for them more was, is it one group of sponges or is it a bunch of groups? Are sponges paraphyletic? Yeah. Basically, 
a bunch of different sponge groups, which gave rise to the rest of the animals. And and I don't think, right now, I don't think there's enough genetic information or, in principle, not enough fossil information because sponges are not exactly the easiest thing to deliver useful fossils. Yeah, yeah. no, they, they're, yeah, they're not really super great about fossils. And as of right now, all sponges are monophyletic, but I think it would be very interesting if sponges were paraphyletic because... I would say I would I would venture a guess that we probably went through a sponge grade without actually being sponges. Yeah. The main the main take home on all of this is all of the, the supposed well we're different from this because of this that right. in every example you can take as you start looking at more and more and more and more and more organisms those all dissolve and you realize that there's an example of an almost this and a nearly that and a grade of this in every instance if you right. bother to look. And the way anti evolutionists do that is to not look. Yeah, and they go, oh, look at these huge divides. There's nothing that could possibly bridge this gap. Yeah, blah, 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 yeah. whatever. We've yeah. seen it. And, Next. and even, even the information, so I would say everybody must remember that nobody would have a bigger smile on their face to know the modern state of paleontology and genetics than Charles Darwin. He would go, yeah. Okay, and what about you, what you RJ? What's your, what? We're going to be talking about Evolution Hour this Wednesday. Oh, gosh. Uh, let me see what the next... Uh, in addition to the uh, the standard uh, Jensen diatribe, uh, next on the on the part two stupid um, is some uh, creationist going on about a, a hadrosaur dinosaur found in Africa that supposedly completely undermines the role of oceanic dispersal in dinosaur biogeography. And I'm going, oh, dear, dear, dear boy. This was probably... Not a topic to to uh, bring up. Uh, Clary riffs off of it. In are um, these are these still live dinosaurs or they they, they no 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 these are uh, these are uh, a technical paper on the discovery okay. of hadrosaur from Africa. And oh, they okay, have okay. thought a North American taxa, and so okay. it's having interesting biogeographical relationships. It's no coincidence. Spoiler alert: that. The forms that these represent are ones that are relatively small hadrosaurs and are good at swimming. Okay, mm -hmm. I thought the, I thought they were talking about again, like the dinosaurs still live in Africa. People see no, no, time. and and Argument. now that I have uh, completed the great sorting of the tens of thousands of pieces of paper that were fire hazards in my basement, uh, and gotten everything reformatted for the various books in volume two. Um, is now I'm back into the geology uh, chapter, uh, the big slosh tales, and uh, putting it. There's a little footnote in there about uh, creationist um, uh, credentials, and there was a bunch of stuff that I had I'd forgotten that I'd had about some of the idiot. This one guy is an anti evolutionist, a shroud of Turin groupie, a mm -hmm. bad check uh, kiter, a writes papers with imaginary sources that have to be retracted by. And a fellow accusing uh, another, an American in Russia, of being an FBI spy. That is an interesting trail there, Interesting RJ. range. He's sort of like, if you think that Carl Baugh and Kent Hovind exhaust the possibilities of, what? <laughs> this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a new one. Up, shoots off the list, and it, it turns out there's an enormous amount of, of scandals that just keep popping up over the years with this guy. Uh, Dmitry um, uh, Kuznetsov uh, is his name, and uh, he just has a weird paper trail, so he's going to in that one little blip on there. And uh, anyway, yeah, so um, uh, we're keeping busy beavers on all the different projects on stuff, and uh, we're going to keep at it so long as we can keep at it. Just got hit with income tax to pay. My tax bill this year turned out to be a slightly less than half of the amount of money that Donald Trump paid in taxes in the last year. Uh, What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> but it's that, not that I mine is so gigantic, it's just his is so small. <laughs> well, if you guys haven't subscribed to them yet, do so. I'm, I'm pretty sure Lisa Lisa's already subscribed to you both. So so no need yeah, to well, tell her that. As Lisa is reminding so we, we yeah, it came from rocks. Yeah, but but in the meantime, we'll see y'all later. Never never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see y'all next time.